Welcome to another edition of the Kevin Steen Show, an edition that's starting at 10.30 in the morning, which is a pretty reasonable time considering we usually do this in the middle of the night. And as you can see, my guest is one Gabe Sapolsky. On How's camera. It going? On Good. camera. On camera. You know, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. All right, cool. But I never knew if we could ever get the times right. We're not really at the same place too often. No, uh, no. We should be while. more, though. I agree. But I guess that's not going to... We'll see. Yeah. Who knows what's yeah. going to happen. Well, hopefully, I don't see you for a long time. Yeah, well, Pretty we'll soon. see all that stuff. Yeah. But uh, Gabe, former Ring of Honor booker, current Dragon Gate USA booker, everybody else. Current father as well, yes, sir. which uh, to me is a little mind blowing. I have to admit. Yeah. Well, because I remember, I believe the year was two thousand eight. Uh, <laughs> my kid was about four, five months old, maybe a little older, and uh, we brought him to a show. Me and my wife, and we walked in, and I had him in my arms, and Gabe came to say hi, and then you saw my kid, and. Before I even tried to like have any, you was like, I I'm really not good with babies, okay? I'm like, yeah, don't worry, we're good. You don't have to hold them. But you were like, I, 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 I then, wouldn't, I didn't even know how to hold. Them I remember you were then. telling me that. And not only that, but um, I, I just hated kids all together. <laughs> yes, I remember you I, saying I that no too. I had no desire to to talk to kids, to have <laughs> to kids, to just be around them. Yeah, to be around one. But and now you got your own, and it's awesome. It's he's like four. the greatest thing. Yeah, Jack. he's four. Yep, and it's it's the best thing that ever happened. To I me. remember when you told me that your wife was pregnant. I couldn't believe it because yeah. of everything. Why? That you because just he didn't think that she no, had. No, I thought that you <laughs> just were. No, that's never gonna happen. Yeah. What uh, What made it change? Like, it what made just, you decide that? It just kind of happened. Right. Yeah, it just kind of happened. Kind of the same thing with me, I guess. When yeah. I was twenty one, I was like, I was traveling to like L A every two weeks, and you know, just part, like having fun. And I'm like, there's no way I'll ever have a kid. Yeah. Then when I was twenty three, and I met my wife, I was like, ah, let's get one of those things. Well, I'll say. Um, we had a midwife, right? Okay. And uh, the, and one thing that's very true that the midwife said to us is when your kid wants to get here, your kid's gonna get here. Yeah. It's not really something you control. It I know. About I it. know people try to have babies, or they don't try to have mm. babies, or they use protection or whatever. But I I, I did buy that a hundred percent. But when when your kid wants to get here, your kid's out there. Left somewhere. Find a way. Yeah. And when your kid wants to get here, they'll, they'll get here. So uh, did you freak out a little when she told you she was pregnant? Like how? Yeah, that, yeah. 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 I mean, it's it is a completely different life right now. Yeah. You know, like Ring of Honor, like. My whole life was Ring of Honor. It seemed, it, it, but it, it doesn't it seem like that? It, it wasn't even that long ago, but it seems so far away. It, it was a different lifetime ago. Right? Yeah. yeah. So cr I, I think that's what happens when you get a kid, though. Everything that happened before you had the kid is like once you have the kid and you've had it for a couple of years, like that's just so far away. Even if it was a year ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Cause it changes a, everything. It's a completely different life. But it's awesome, too. Yeah. I think when you get a certain age, too, like we were 37 when uh -huh. we had the kid, and it's like, all right, what are we going to do? Go out to another dinner, you know? Right. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I, I wouldn't want a kid when I was in my 20s, you know, right. I off on travel. I was 23. Okay, you're young then. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't change anything about yeah. it, but I know exactly what so, you mean. But we like, reach a point, it's like, all right, well, what do you want to do? Well, we'll sit here and watch a movie or whatever. <laughs> and now it's like, you know, we did all that. And you kind of, I think by the time you're kind of the, at the age we were, you kind of, done everything you want to do for yourself. I mean, maybe there's still, there's still career goals. I mean, you know, yeah, there's still that kind of stuff. But like, personally, you've done everything that you kind of wanted to do at that point. Maybe you want to travel more or whatever. But right. like the kid, like, when you have a kid, like opens up that whole other world now. Now yeah. it's like, like I It's played. a different sense of fulfillment you get from, you know what I mean? Like, no matter how well your career's going, yeah. you can't get, and you know, for a lot of people that are watching it that don't have kids, they're probably like, yeah, yeah, you love your kids. I, I can we picture, get it. <laughs> I can picture some like 18 year old watching this right now. You like, couldn't care like, less. Sucks. You <laughs> listen, you little <laughs> shit. <laughs> but uh, I'm getting ripped off on this DVD right now. This <laughs> One guy, in the whole time I've been doing these, I got one complaint on Twitter about one of the interviews I did. It was uh, with the one I did with Paul London, because I guess people purchased it in the hopes of hearing us talk about wrestling and hearing what Paul thinks of WWE and all this stuff. And we spent about 20 minutes talking about current day wrestling and a solid hour and a half talking about... Uh, bacon, the bacon in Paul's sandwich looking like Freddy Krueger's dick, and uh, if hot girls shit their pants a lot, stuff like that. So the guy was real upset. Yeah. The first and only complaint I got. That's no, Paul London, so he kind of wanted to but, I mean, take it a different direction. I didn't, like, 
I, it's the, it literally the interview with Paul starts with him undressing because he had just wrestled and he's taking his clothes off and that's how he started, and uh, like I don't know what this guy expected out of an interview with Paul London, but anyway, so yeah, you know, but the kid, it's it it like a lot of stuff that was fun that you didn't have no cause to do anymore because yeah. you're like a grown adult, like yeah. you get to redo. Like I play Legos almost every day, going to the park. Like, I get to go see kids' movies. Going to, and we took best. him to his first movie a couple weeks ago. What we went to the it? Lego movie. Right? Uh, the he best got, movie of all time. Yeah, by the way, it was right? really good. It's unbelievable. Great job. Cars, Cars the movie, the first one, is a sensational movie. It's I'm a great so movie. I'm so sick of it. Because my I've son watched it a hundred times. I'm not really? sure. Oh I'm my like, god! I watched the first time without my son. He wasn't even a thing back then. <laughs> like he wasn't a, a hope I had or a dream. He was non-existent, and I didn't mind it. But once my kid came, I had I've had to watch it. 200 times, yeah. and I can't stand it. The second one is pure garbage. Oh, it's an abomination. You hate it, right? I, I, I refuse to buy any toys from the second one. I, I, I bought them all because I'm an asshole. Okay. But I, I won't buy I won't support the second one. There's a third one coming out soon, too. Or they're, oh. they're starting on a third really? one. Really? So that's I know they the, made Planes, which is the exact same fucking thing. Yeah, except it wasn't well done. Planes was kind of boring. My yeah. kid's into Planes right now, so I'm on the is plane it? cycle, which I, I can't pay attention to Planes. My son's not into like the Disney movies anymore, so Cars just... You know, to, yeah. but then he'll see a toy, and all of a sudden he's right back into it. Yeah. But he doesn't want to watch a movie; he just wants the stupid yeah. toy. How much? How many? How many toys do you buy? Do you spoil them? It's ridiculous. Yeah. No, like it's bad. I always swear to myself, it's my addiction now. It's I yeah. say, like I'm not buying anything, and then uh, they, an they, hour later, yeah, right? you feel, or you, you know, he loved this. You end up buying it for yourself, really. You know, <laughs> like I, I do that half the time. But I feel like uh, I do that too, and then I regret it about two days later when it's on the floor and he won't pick it up. And I step on it on my way to the fucking living room because he leaves. <laughs> my kid still plays everywhere. with everything. He still plays with everything. Not me. He we goes through to... phases, but he doesn't really? allow me to throw anything out. Okay. So it just sits there. I went through to like try to clean out the house because our whole house is just toys top to bottom. And I'm, I'm like, well, he, I mean, he might not touch something for a month or two, but he always goes back to it. Yeah. And I'm like, well, we can't throw that out. We can't throw that out. But I buy quality toys too. I don't buy junk. I see. So we keep it. I, you know, I buy real uh, trains, real trains. That means lots of people out there. Oh, right. So uh, Legos, you know. The, I hate the Legos. Stuff. I love the Lego movie, but there's <laughs> nothing worse. Than, when, at Christmas, when people give my kids Legos, I... I like, like fighting them. them. It's, it's, it's very, I don't like it. It's very relaxing. A bit. I'm I'm the heel. You know the heel in the movie, the uh, yeah. Lord Business yeah. who <laughs> tries to glue shit. That's me. When I was watching the movie, Owen turned me. He's like, "Daddy, that's you." I just try to glue the pieces together so that I don't have to rebuild it every two fucking hours. Wow. That was me. You're the heel. Completely. I was. I, I was Will Ferrell. <laughs> Ugh, I hate that fucker too. But uh, yeah, so. Um, the kid came, like, I remember when my kid was born, I was 23, the minute he was born, they're like, get him dressed, and he's this tiny little thing. I thought I was going to break his fucking arm oh, trying yeah. to put a shirt on him. What, like, that was my, like, that's when I realized, like, holy shit, my life just changed so much, because somehow it hadn't hit me yet. Yeah. It's when it was in, on that little table, and I was like, oh my god. When did that come for you that you realize like this is everything's my, my big thing that I was so scared of was you know they can't support their head so yeah yeah, neck, yeah 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 I was so scared of like damaging his neck yeah. or, or the head like it, it just it took a while now like you know I take a baby I'll throw it up in there and catch it to <laughs> be fine so, and yeah. so now it's all good so but, uh, uh, but yeah it's just uh, I mean. It, you know, you read books or whatever, but it it is a kind of. But the thing too is that if you do screw up and you put the diaper on wrong or something, the baby really doesn't know. No, <laughs> you know, so yeah. you, uh, you learn how to do as it. As long as you don't smack it around, you're pretty fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you just gotta keep it alive. Yeah. It seems like an easier concept than it is, though. But yeah. so, any chance of uh, baby number two? Or? Yeah, when your kid wants to come along, your kid comes along. You're right. Yeah, now we're so both you're not there. closing the window. But we're both. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, if it happens, it happens. Yeah. But I mean, we're, we're both getting older now, so we're I forty-one. Got but I'm I'm very content with one kid, but I don't know. I do miss now that he's like a toddler. Like he's, babies, he's older right? than a toddler now. I mean, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, yeah, he's becoming four, right? he's like a kid now. You know, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, his personality. He's got kind of attitude and, and personality. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can't just do whatever you want with it. I miss that. Yeah, I'm getting another one in about a week now, though. Yeah. So it's oh. back to the trunk board yeah. for me. But... Yeah, then you're back into the diapers and oh, all that. But fuck, I forgot about the diapers. That's the whole thing too. Oh god, it is it is a work. Like there is a, there is a lot of bad stuff that no one or not bad but hard really hard things that no one really tells you about and then you're like I've I've, I've shared the wealth like every, every one of my friends since I had a kid that he's like hey 
my girlfriend's pregnant, my wife's pregnant, like, look at this is what's gonna happen. And I just tell him everything. Yeah. And like, when I'm done, it's usually like an hour long speech. <laughs> when I'm done, Cedric Alexander, before his kid was born, I just sat him down, I told him everything. He was like exhausted after, he's like, oh, thanks. And he walked away, he's like, Literally woozy, couldn't believe what we was about to get in. Well, because everyone tells you how great it's going to be, and they don't tell you that. Yeah, you got to mix with the parts gotta, where you want to just fucking rip your hair out. Yeah, and you're waking up every two... You're just not sleeping at all that first year. On the first two weeks, yeah. I sat on a windowsill every night yeah. for hours, and I would just sleep against the window, because he woke up every 20 minutes. Yeah. And I didn't want my wife to have to keep getting up, but I also didn't want to have to lie down, get up, lie, so I just sat on his windowsill like this. And just get up every 20 minutes for two weeks. Yeah. And I was working and I was wrestling. It was just... Anyway. Yeah. I but it's to... awesome. Overall, it's awesome. Yeah, it is. It, it gives it gives life a new meaning. Yeah, it's definitely different. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. 18-year-old, be yeah. happy and we're done with the kids now. <laughs> Let's talk about wrestling. Yeah. So uh, this all started with ECW for you, kind of, right? Yeah. But, I mean, obviously you were watching wrestling when you were younger. Oh, yeah. You, you didn't, like, discover ECW. That was your first taste yeah. of wrestling, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, no, no. Of course, I grew up watching it. So. Did you grow up watching it? Those were the days. Um, the first thing I ever remember was Saturday mornings, because that's when everything happened. Yeah. WWF was on, and there's a Greg Valentine promo. <laughs> and, like, I was just flipping channels. Because back then, we, people flipped channels. Sure. You, and you only had, like, five channels, too. Right. So, like... Was it on the TV that you had to turn? Yeah, and yeah. Not? It's a, lot, it's a lot. It's a lot more that, work. To that's why I wonder, like, right. how people are gonna just like new fans are gonna discover wrestling now because no one flips channels anymore because you got the guides on your TV, right? So you just see what's on and then, then you, you just go. pick it. Yeah, you'll so, never scroll past fucking Rey Mysterio hitting a hurricane. Yeah, you're never you're like, gonna oh. just accidentally like flip right, it because that's see. exactly what happened to me. I just flipped. And especially with this network thing where people actually have to order the internet and yeah, all that yeah, stuff, yeah. no one's going to do that unless they're so like think, a fan already. Do like, you think nowadays wrestling might suffer from the fact that people just won't fall into it? I, yeah, no one's going to yeah. fall. How are you going to fall into it now? That's a good point, actually. You know? yeah. It's just not going to happen. So anyway, so that's what happened. I'm hitting the channel Saturday morning and this Greg Valentine promo comes on. <laughs> I didn't know it was Greg Valentine. Yeah. I might not be. I might you were just struck by his lustrous air. I guess so, honest. but I was just like, wow. Which has stood this, uh, the test of time. It has. Right? I saw him earlier yeah. walking across the street. <laughs> this fucking hair is still flawless. I saw him at the Tampa airport a couple years ago and like you see him halfway across the airport. Well, of course. He's, it's like the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Greg Valentine was weird because he's like one of those guys you just see at an airport like every two years. Yeah, for right. No, for like... no real reason. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Hey, Greg, what are you doing? <laughs> Oh, the airport. <laughs> I seen him at the Chicago airport, the Tampa airport. Like seriously, I just see him at random airports every couple of years. But um, but uh, yeah, and then I was just like, what was the promo? Do you remember the yeah. actual? It version? was just probably like a local Boston Garden yeah, promo. Okay. But back then, the Boston Garden, back then it was like a whole different thing. It was like really like dirty and gritty. Like okay. you'd go to the old house shows and everything. That's funny. I was talking. I had a bunch of guys from our, our locker room. With, uh, you mentioned Triangle USA, I gotta mention Evolve Wrestling too. Yeah, it's true, okay. I should have said Evolve too, yes, sorry. Yes. But um, we were all hanging out in the hotel uh, Thursday, again, ready to go over to the show with a bunch of guys, and I go, um, I go, have you guys ever been at like a show where there's like a riot with like the locker room and the fans? And they were like, no, like nobody, have you been at a show where there's been, okay. And the closest seen... was us. Almost fighting Green Lantern fan at a IHOP after a show. Uh, Green Jersey Lantern. All-Pro okay. show. That does not That's count. the closest. Okay. <laughs> That's not, because back then you'd go to the Boston Garden and there'd be like 15, 20 fights in the crowd. You know, like, like, seri it was like a rough. That sounds awesome. And that's how it used to be, like, all over the place. And you'll watch the old house shows. When you watch the old house shows on, like, WWE Network, yeah. you'll see parts where you just see, like, 20 cops go, like, running <laughs> across the hard camera and everything. And that's because there's, like, a legitimate fight in the crowd. <laughs> and then ECW, I mean, there were, like, riots, like, every three to four months. Like, legit riots. Like I remember... Watching the pay per view where the XPW guys tried to come fuck with the crowd. That was not even like a real. That was nothing, uh, right? Yeah, that was not, I mean, there was like down. legit, like, like I remember one show. This was when I kind of like I was a little taken back. Okay. There's one show in Allentown, and Pennsylvania, uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, which was a great city for ECW for a while, and then it kind of died off. I don't know what happened there, but anyways, um, Shane Douglas. I was doing the fan cam thing. And Shane Douglas, like some fan jumped him or something, or she, he might touch Francine or whatever, and Shane goes into the crowd. And Shane's like fighting the fan. I'm sitting there with the fan can, and I'm like, no one's coming out of the locker room or nothing, right? And there's like this fight going on in the crowd. So I go run into the locker room, which was just all pipe and drape, right? And I just look around, everyone's just kind of sitting around, like no one has any clue. And I go, Shane's in the crowd. And all of a sudden, I swear to God, it's like 20 guys just get up, and they go plowing like 
through uh, through the pipe and drape, and that section where Shane was was right there, and it's like a bulldozer of twenty guys just smashing through the section, and like to a bunch of people that had nothing to do with it. It doesn't matter because everyone would just start fighting. So like there was like a legit fight, and that would happen like Jim Thorpe. I'd always try to go stand there, Paul Heyman. It was just like what I did, you know. I don't, uh, I don't know. Just but, see his reaction. Yeah, just he'd always be in like the corner of the building watching all. And I remember like Jim Thorpe, like a was, mad scientist. Yeah, like like there was one time I was just standing there with him, and he'd always take me and grab me and pull me back too. And like, and I was just standing there in the corner of like the Jim Thorpe building, which is like this little bar okay. kind of hole in the wall place, and just looking out, and like everywhere you looked, there's like wrestlers fighting fans like all across the building like this is just happening and then it just kind of ends this is on tape somewhere no, no see because back then we'd had the one fan cam right. and the tape would disappear after all that stuff oh, I see. and um i mean now you'd have like now nobody would be fighting everyone would like just have their cell phones well, fucking, all these <laughs> yeah. Like yeah exactly so like it's not but back then there was no recording right. of it so, so like, people can actually fight. People were so busy fighting. just doing this. Yeah, I see. Maybe that's why people don't fight anymore. Because Maybe I fall into spring peace yeah. to the world. Yeah, they to the wrestling shows. But anyway. yeah, I was asking. Uh, I was asking like, no, no, this whole generation of wrestlers like they never like seen anything like that or no, a part no, of it, no. and it's like something that legitimately like used to happen like all the time. And that's you know? like when you're a kid. I assume that brings such a crazy. Aura to wrestling. That's like, where it was going back full circle right. with Greg Valentine promo. Then you start seeing the Boston Garden and you're like, oh man, this is like the craziest shit right. ever. You know? Yeah. I remember, like, I would equate it to, for me, like, the way you're describing it, I've never seen anything like that, but there used to be this minor hockey league uh, near where I, I lived. And, you know, it was like men, it wasn't like kids, it was, but it was, you know, it wasn't a professional hockey league. It was, it was way smaller, except the team, one particular team was. Like reputable for the fights they would like create, yeah, and it would sell out the arena. It was like literally slap shot. It's yeah. the same kind of phenomenon. I was what, fifteen at the time. I would go. I couldn't care less about the game. Yeah, I was one of those bloodthirsty assholes. The fights were so insane. It was nuts. Incredible, and the fucking players would get in fights with the with the fans. Yeah. They would scale the window and just <laughs> die. It was incredible. I get that's the same kind of like me too. Like that building, I still drive by it sometimes. That's the craziest building in the world because I remember all this insane shit. Yeah. So to you, that the there's a boss. They, they called it the bar. There's a boss garden. Right? Yeah. That's what. But it, it happened. I mean, you see it. You watch the Spectrum shows. Yeah. You watch any of those old shows, right? and you'll see you'll see where there's like 20 cops. All of a sudden, will go fucking flying through the, the hard cam or whatever. <laughs> and that's where they're going. There's like a legit... Now if you see anybody run past the hard cam, just take a sign away. <laughs> yeah. We don't want punk sign, okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, that snowballed into you eventually wanting to be involved in wrestling. Just It was really it. like... I, I, I was uh, going... I'll just go run through this quick. Cause Please, go nuts. Yeah, yeah. It was my senior year at Temple and ECW started and I wrote Todd Gordon like an actual letter. Okay. Just, man, I gotta check the time and okay. uh, you know, my wife's really close to giving birth so when this vibrates yeah, I have I to take you. a look at it that would be awesome that, that was just my mom would that be awesome in the middle of the interview you gotta my, I'm my wife's so giving birth scared. I, I, I once uh, I like for my first kid I was doing it, we were really close to the due date and I, there was an IWS show that night but I told him I couldn't wrestle because I could have to leave at any moment yeah because like the next day she was due she didn't want me to go but I'm like oh, I'm gonna go do commentary at least they'll pay me so while I'm on commentary that night at least 30 times, anytime this would like vibrate, I would just, I would say it on commentary, like, oh, gotta go. And I'd come in and out, in and out. They ended up throwing out the commentary. It's just a show, on DVD, it's a show with no commentary because I ruined it. So, hey, if you see me run out, Gabe's gonna hold down the fort because I'm having a kid. So, anyway, you were saying? So, anyways, long story short, I wanted to do a newsletter and my senior year at Temple just as a, like a hobby. Okay. And like now you get like a hundred emails. Back then I, there was like no email. So like I wrote Todd Gordon an actual letter and it was like, a, you know, I was educated. It's a nice professional letter. It was well written. Yeah. yeah. Nice penmanship. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I typed it, you know, oh. <laughs> business, business format. That's not an actual letter. Yeah, business actual format. letters, you got the pen with the feather <laughs> and you dip it. Come on. But, uh, but he was like, yeah, sure, go right it, you know? So, um, but then the ECW office opened uh, shortly after I was done with school. Uh -huh. And since I had already my foot in the door for like right. a year at that point, I got the job at the office. And then I figured, all right, I, I didn't feel like moving back home with my parents yet. You so. did like everything. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I figured, you know, I'll, this will last a year or two. Mm -hmm. And then like, it just kept going on. So how did Heyman, when did Heyman come into that whole operation? Heyman was, it was weird because um, Heyman like, 
ignored me for six months, which was cool because he probably just. I mean, who the fuck was I? You know? yeah. So he wanted to see if I was sticking around or what I was about. I remember the first interview I did with Heyman was like the weirdest thing because I actually did like shoot interviews with the guys for the newsletter and everything. The pioneer, right? Yeah, here. you know. Now, then I got to the point where I just started writing all the quotes myself. But like, I remember they used to drive me nuts for the newswire, <laughs> by the way. You gotta like, why doesn't he that. just ask me? Because I was fucking lazy, dude. They do, like, I don't want a shit to do. It's just, worse today. Like today, the quotes, like you at least tried to make it sound like me. Yeah. But today, they literally just, like, the quotes are, I would never ever say any of that like yeah. this. But anyway, it's period. a different game today, writing on the internet, too. I don't think people re want to read anything. I think you got to do bullet point, bullet point, bullet yeah. point. Yeah. But, anyways, okay. So, um, yeah, so the first, I actually got Heyman to do an interview with me my first weekend in. And he did the whole interview like this. He's wearing a baseball cap, and you're me. And they're sitting there, like, you know, I'm a journalism guy, you make eye contact, you do all this. And he's sitting there with the baseball cap down. And he did the whole interview like this, where I'm talking <laughs> to the bill of the cap. And I thought it was like the weirdest thing. Do you remember what, the, what was on the cap? I'm curious. No, I have no idea. Wasn't a Yankees hat? I have no idea. I don't remember. I just thought it was, it was extremely strange. He's just trying to get a glimpse of his eyes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's not uh, just lying down <laughs> looking up at him. Then you're like, uh, so then, you know, you're intimidated by him for a, little, for a while after that. And then, like, um, but then after about six days, six months, I'd say it took about six months or so. For him to make eye contact with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then, then, then you start talking more and more. And then, um, I don't know, I don't know how it got to the point where, like, he would call me after the shows. But okay. I think that I was just, like, the only guy up at 5 a.m. that, like, wouldn't argue with him about stuff when he just wanted to, like, Say, hey, blah, 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 blah. yeah, yeah, and I just sit there with my mouth shut and like, you know, listen, and then I'd sit there the whole time and go, wow, this is all awesome stuff mm -hmm. that I'm learning, but right. like, I'm never gonna use any of this. <laughs> like, what's the point of all this? But then, you know, turns out, yeah, turns yeah. out I did. <laughs> so, um, you were doing all kinds of shit for ECW for a while. Yeah, right? well, the whole time I was there. The whole time, the, yeah, right? I was there. I, my first show was the first show Heyman booked, okay. and my last show was the last, last show. One. Yeah. How uh, how did that feel? The last show, like oh, it's just horrible, it terrible, sucked. right? Yeah, yeah. Because not only that, but ECW. What was the last show? Was it a pay per view? No, it was. No, there was um, house. We were in where went Poplar Bluff. It was so weird because it's like it was a Pine Bluff. Missouri and Poplar Bluff, Arkansas, like two places like we never ran. Two before. pretty hot towns. Yeah, like. it was like two places we never ran before, and like, um, like uh, two. Uh, neither crowd was great. It was just like a weird weekend. It was a terrible. And farewell. then there was a. That was my first bad running with a prostitute too. My first. That's implying there's more. But no, that was like on the road because like it was the weirdest thing because we stayed in Memphis and like it was just like this crack. Or hotel and like we checked in we got to our room and all of a sudden there's banging on the door <laughs> and there's just like these whores like you guys ready for us and we're and there's like a used condom under the bed oh. and it was just a terrible it was just a terrible what weekend. what drew the prostitutes to your door. That's what I want to know. Like, you don't know. We, I think that we were just at the hotel. Like, Wrong place. We were probably time. at like the whorehouse hotel and didn't realize it. You think we that's how just, they go about business there? Yeah, I think that's They just go knocking down the doors like Girl Scouts. I think that probably people who want to use the whores like stay at that hotel. Like they know that in town. They come to you. Yeah, they I know see. that They know that in the town. But like being us being out of town was like, we didn't know that. <laughs> so we were like, oh, well, this hotel's only $40 a night. You know, great, we'll stay here. So like that's why, uh, but yeah, that was that was it was terrible. Yeah. And then it was bad too because I cried in Francine's arms, and which is embarrassing. And then like we did the shoot interview with her at ROH like okay. ten years later, and she starts yelling about across the office how I cried in her arms. She remembered it. Yeah, it was embarrassing. I don't, I'm sorry, Francine. It's embarrassing. Now. She was that mad about you crying in her arms. No, she wasn't mad. She was like teasing me. But it's been worse. Could have just shoved your head through her tits and just <laughs> cried. Come on, at least you had decent. Francine was super cool. Yeah, so. I think I met her once. She was pretty nice. She was. She yeah. was super nice. Um, so, like through I the say years, was, but she probably she's still probably still is. Still I just, to her just haven't seen her in a yeah. while. Um, how uh, so through those years at ECW? What's some like crazy memories or just your favorite moments or? Hit me with your favorite moment and your like the worst moment ever. Well, the worst moment was crying in Francine's arms. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, That's it. Okay. So uh, the best, the best moment was um, Paul Heyman's speech before Barely Legal. And a I legendary had, speech. Yeah, I was yeah. actually talking to Paul about that because they're doing that DVD on him. Yeah. And I'm like, you gotta get that speech as like the whole a DVD thing, right? bonus. 
because it was I watched the whole thing with J T Smith, who's like still a good friend of mine. Uh-huh. I don't talk to him as often as I should, but he's he's still a good friend of mine, and he really took care of me. He's really like a dude who deserves credit for the start of ECW that doesn't get it is J T okay. Smith. Like he was really crucial for like those first couple years, just stuff he did around Philadelphia and mm-hmm. in ring, and just being kind of an ambassador for the company back then. But um, and I mean he, I think of the stuff he did for me. He used to. I, I didn't realize at the time because I didn't know the geography of Philadelphia, but he used to drive like an hour out of his way to like pick me up and drop oh, me off from the shows both ways. Just stuff like he didn't have that's to do cool. any of that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just a super You get cool some one. people in wrestling, they're just really good people. And they don't get the credit. No. JT's one of those guys. And, um, but, um, but, uh, yeah, I sit standing in the back with JT because he was there as like a surprise. So Paul put him on the show as like a pre-show. Uh, just just kind of, I guess it was kind of respect because he did start the company and he wanted right. them to get him there. And um, we were just both watching and like our, our jaws were on the floor. Like I was ready to jump off the building after that speech. It was, yeah. That's why I don't give, you notice I never gave any locker room speeches, right? Yeah, I remember we put you on the spot once, actually. Do you remember it was the first show at the uh, Hammerstein? I, I did that on purpose because I wanted to make a point that that we sold out that yeah, entire Yeah, but building. I remember you yeah. got you, like you're gonna, about to talk in the ring, and then I said, "Everybody take a knee," and you're like, "No, no, no," and we all did it anyway. You're like. Well, now it's awkward. <laughs> I, I, I remember I did want to talk to everybody that day just because yeah. it was an accomplishment that we did sell out every single seat. Yeah. I wanted everyone to look at what, every the, single seat and see that we sold it. The DVD, it, I'm sure that was your call. The DVD of that show, it's, it was called A New Era, right? I, I forget. You, I don't remember like, it starts with the, the camera going like through the curtain and just filming the entire yeah, place. Yeah, probably. That was, I remember coming out and I remember looking. Like, it was me and Generico against uh, Davey and Romero. Okay. We were, like, second match. And I remember looking around, and I was just blown away. That the whole pla- like the whole place was packed. Yeah, it was so incredible. Crazy, dude. Right. And Because uh, it was never supposed to... None of that stuff that happened was supposed to happen. Like, going right. to London and Tokyo and all mm-hmm. that. But anyways, um, yeah. Oh, okay, so I was saying I never gave speeches because I'm not, like... I grew up in the business seeing all these Paul Heyman speeches mm-hmm. and then for me to go and try to do that would have just been me trying to imitate Paul which would have been terrible <laughs> and then like so and I always believed too I had a different philosophy that if you really want to communicate something to somebody you um, you do, say it one on one and personally to right. them you know it, you're, I think and I think now with the boys too is I see it I go to shows and I see these you know, the promoters and bookers trying to give these speeches yeah. and like half the guys are like you know oh, they're looking all the around. time yeah and, and you know, you're not getting your message across. If you want to get a message across, and it's important enough to get yeah. the message across, you sit down with them and you have a mm-hmm. talk, you know? And what are you talking, you know, you need 10, 15 minutes. So if you really have something important to say, you can't take 10, 15 minutes and say it face to face, you know? That's true. So. Plus in those locker room speeches, there's always an asshole in the back making snipe remarks. Yeah, That's, yeah. Most of the time it's me, but yeah. anyway, <laughs> it takes one. That's why you get all that heat, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> such an asshole. So, uh, ECW, Closes unfortunately, and how like at that point, where did you see yourself go in wrestling? Like I you know, was done. Like you were I, done, right? Yeah, I had no idea. Because um, that's like losing a giant piece of yourself, which is why you ended up crying in Francie's arms, yeah. just so I could remind everybody. <laughs> but, yeah, and not only that, but ECW was like so much fun, and there's like no pressure. Uh, well, on me because it was uh, I'd show up I'd sell programs I'd have that I'd have I'd have ninety minutes of high pressure where like I'd have that ninety minutes before the show to sell programs and make money mm-hmm. but it was all cash too so it was awesome mm-hmm. and then like I'd tape the shows and I learned a lot I think that's something because I know like my biggest weakness is like a booker is like I'm not in the ring right so I, I don't I've know never if that's done necessarily that. a it's a weakness it's a weakness so. but like where I do feel that I I have learned timing and pacing and all that stuff is. I was inside the guardrail for 90% of those ECW matches and I felt when the crowd would come up and down right. during a show and when you do it for that long for that many shows it does become part of your instinct. I gotta ask just so because you, just because yeah. you touched on it and we can come back to this but why do you feel like never being in the ring is a weakness as a book? Well when I go alright Kevin um, you know for this finish why don't you go through a table and then get take a suit I think I remember or something. It, it, uh, you know, Maybe we've talked about this before. I think yeah. you remember telling me something like that. Yeah. Where you like, and I. Here's the thing. Like, I feel like I see what you mean, but you, everybody who's got any sense, like it's common sense. You know what you're kind of asking. You yeah. know what I mean? And you, I mean. Well, I never. I don't remember you like asking us to do anything we didn't want to do. You I know don't. What I, mean? I don't. Um. And I. I also there's a way to do it. Like I. First of all, 
it goes both ways too. If I, I put my trust in you, so if you say, "Oh, well, me and what crazy matches did you do for me?" I'm sure. Me and Generico against the Briscoes. Okay, yeah. If you go, me, we want to do this crazy thing off the ladder with the with the Briscoes. I'm gonna go. All right. If, do you think you can do that safely? Yeah. And if you tell me yes, I think I can do it safely. I'll take your word. Yeah. The same way that if you say I go to you and I go, well, I think it'd be cool if you did like a package pile driver from the top of a ladder through four tables on the floor on a pile of burning chairs and you go, I don't think I can do that safely. I don't push it either. Right. You know, so it goes both ways with that. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of people, like I see it on the internet, they go, oh, you're telling them to do this and that. But it's like, I put my trust in you. If you I remember, just because you opened that little yeah. window too, I remember, you remember when I did this interview online and somebody asked me my memory of ladder war. Yeah. And I said, the one memory that stuck out with oh, me, I was pissed. Go you ahead. were so <laughs> mad. I said, uh, but here's why it stuck out, yeah. and I think I explained that to you or not, but I or said, it was, just an, it was an interview online, it was like 10 questions, and one of the questions was, what is your one memory that sticks out from Ladder War with the Briscoes? And for some reason, when I read the question, the first thing I thought of was after the match, Generico hurt his leg in the, on the finish. So when we got to the back, Generico was on the ground holding his leg, and I'm looking at him, and we're putting ice, and we're like, oh man, and we just had this brutal match. And Gabe... Is watching the TV and Jimmy Jacobs is doing the promo with Briscoe bleeding all over him, and you're like so psyched, which I understood because it was an amazing visual. And you're like, yes, yes. He literally looked at you and go, "Are you okay?" And before he could even answer, you're out the door because you just saw something. But that's because I thought PJ was gonna. Here's, okay. Go here's ahead. the thing. I understand. Like I didn't see why you were leaving. I just remember Janelle going, uh, "Yeah," and then you were out, and the, like I, I, I remember him going. And then he went back to selling. So I wrote... Um, B, BJ Whitmer came up to me and he goes, um, he's going to pass out from blood. So then I right. thought, I go, oh my God, Jay Briscoe. This, I go, so, yes. And then I'm like, Jay Briscoe's see, about to die. So. I never knew that. <laughs> yeah. But I just saw you ask and then leave. Yeah. And I wasn't even mad. I just, for some reason, that's the one thing that stuck out from the match. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I put it, I, that's what I answered. And you read it, and you were not pleased. Because it makes me look like a dick when but I'm not. But here's why it stuck out to me, yeah. is because usually, and I've said this before on other interviews, you are the one guy I've ever, like I wrestled for, where the first face we'd see through the curtain for every match was yours. Yeah. And the first thing you'd say, even if you weren't super pleased with the match, was thank you. And then you'd tell us if there was something you didn't like or something you loved. Yeah. But to me, the fact that you weren't there that time, I guess that's what stuck out. But like when I said it, I didn't mean it. Like yeah. I, I didn't mean it as an insult, but I understand why you were upset. And then that's when you told me, like, a lot of fans just look for reasons to fuck with you. Yeah. And that's one of them. Like people will say, oh, you put your wrestlers through shit. You know what I mean? But uh, that's the thing. Obviously, they're wrong because that's like I can attest. You never asked us to do anything that we were uncomfortable with. And if you did, you were like, we tell you no, and you were fine with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? We find an alternative. But uh, yeah, you were pretty upset with that one. Yeah, because uh, then like because then what when what what comes out of that is you know like all right, people can say whatever they want about me because that was a Heyman thing too. You let all the good roll off your back because then you get a giant ego and you let all the bad roll off your but back. But you can only do crazy. that so much, but we're right? Human, dude. We're exactly. Human beings here. Exactly. You know, so you tweet that we're a fucking asshole and like it hurts my feelings. You know, <laughs> that's not what I meant <laughs> though. Right but at it. I get it. But like, some know, people will definitely take yeah, it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not being overly sensitive. You know, and most of the time it doesn't bother me. But then, like for me, especially professionally too, where I'm trying to get people to work for me. Yeah. And they say, and the one thing that comes out of that is oh these guys kill and I never was going to book another ladder war like when uh, I said that no, I was it that. Yeah. because because like I didn't want to put anybody in a position where they felt because if you did another ladder war you'd have to do more you couldn't you couldn't do less it's been quite a burden because we you know yeah. I, once you left, I haven't seen one, one of them I haven't seen one the of second them one so. was hell yeah like it was me and generico against the wolves yeah and Eddie broke his arm the night before yeah Oh my God! Like I wish it had never been booked again because trying to live up to the first one in those circumstances, yeah. just on its own, would have been bad enough. And and I didn't. And as an asshole, greedy promoter, it would also make the first one that much more legendary if it was like. Here's the thing I'm proud of. I think the first one has stood the test of time. I know you yeah. haven't seen any of them, yeah. but I think it stood the test of time. Good. I still think people think it's the best one, and I think the one that they think is the best one, like number two, would be the one I had with Generico in 2010, which. Yeah. If anything, I feel like that's the appropriate. If would have been, if it, it ever had been appropriate to do another one, 
Like, if you had still been in charge, yeah. it probably would have been me and Generico. You yeah. know what I mean? I don't know if you're in Generico, but I probably should say No, you wouldn't have I, done I, that? I, 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 I'm not going to say I wouldn't have done it, but because maybe there would have been no place to go with you guys as a tag team. Right. And I would have been like, all right, we got nothing else to do with you guys, and I don't want to fire you because you worked hard. So That's a, well, that would have been very nice. Then, then, we would have, then we would have done it, but I, it would have taken a lot of talking into. Yeah. So, I mean, it took a lot of talking into from when I pitched that whole thing to Adam, who was in charge at that point. But, yeah. uh, like, the latter war, I felt, uh, like, for some reason, even though the Briscoes won that night, yeah. it became Generico and I's match for some reason, yeah. like, once after you were gone. So, uh, but, like, I'm really proud that the first one stood the test of time because, to me, it was the most special one. And in a way, just the way it was built, I felt that build yeah. was the best yeah. build of any of the latter wars. It, it was, you know what I mean? I, I, I really would never have booked another one for those two reasons. Number one, as a greedy asshole promoter, that would have been the one match where people would have been like, man, they did that one latter yeah. war, and it was insane. And it, I think the match would have been worth more money then. And number two, I didn't want anybody to be in a position because you can't go and do it and then go backwards. You know, mm -hmm. like it, the guys would have to be crazier to try to top that. And yeah. I didn't think there was anything that would be able to top it anyways. So I didn't want to put anyone in a position where they felt like they would have to top it because then, then you are putting people in a dangerous position. Mm -hmm. You know, because you are saying, okay, well, they did all this stuff, and obviously that's a match where even if you tell me we're gonna be safe on everything. <laughs> Get hurt yeah. and like, and it was on the it. weirdest thing too. He pulled his uh, like hamstring on like he took a pile driver. Yeah, it's the weirdest thing. You know, it had nothing to do with the ladder match. Yeah. It could have happened in the ring, just a regular. But match, it was but. just a bad situation, a dangerous situation to put people in. Right. So for those two reasons, like I, I wouldn't have booked another one. But yeah, with that whole thing, because then what happens is on the internet comes this whole thing where oh those guys killed themselves and uh, and Gabe just kind of blew them off. It's definitely not the way I meant to. Yeah, but but it is but. weird that that's the one thing that sticks out from the match, but it, like it's not. Like now yeah. that I think about. About it there's a lot more shit from that match that sticks out it's just when i read that question in the interview that's the first thing i thought of yeah. so i just wrote it yeah yeah but uh man yeah because yeah. bj came up to me i'm like standing there watching bj comes up to me and goes you know Jay, jay's he gonna pass out from so blood. much blood. yeah he goes jay's gonna pass out from blood i still i regret that ain't I, jimmy's gonna hate me for this but jimmy and jacobs and i went back and forth so much on it and i gave him i'm st i'm still mad at myself for giving him because i would wanted him to cut like three lines on that promo and get out like three impact lines and get out and he was like no i'll give this whole speech and everything and it turned into that and then i, I just gave in which i regret. I don't think doing. he would be mad at you saying that because i think he feels the he same feels way the same way i know yeah. that and uh i'm just so mad at myself for giving i'm still that that's, there's some things that like you book and like even like you know like 20 years from they now bother you, you're right? still you're yeah. still gonna be because you're a perfectionist yeah, yeah I um I remember that like the vision because at that point I wasn't friends with Jimmy I barely knew him yeah and I remember you know once I figured out Generico wasn't that hurt I was looking at the screen and Jimmy was in white gear for the like, he, he white came pants up with that, and yeah. white jacket and the visual he was covered. Yeah. It wasn't just it trickled down and it looked cool. It started not looking cool. It started looking like I when he came to the back, I was uneasy. I couldn't be near him. That angle like, would never happen now either. So crazy. I, I regret the whole the whole hey, I, I wouldn't book that. Then. But it was I wasn't saying back I wasn't saying back then. I will I will I will say that, dude. Like why? Because <laughs> like that? I like back then I was just like I just just constantly thinking like how how can uh like how can we make people hate each other? How can we get people to hate each other and and you know top the next angle and do whatever? So like that kind of puts you in that whole different mentality. But I mean obviously now with the whole blood stuff and everything. Yeah. Although everyone has their time. HIV and Hep. Yeah, for this weekend you think people were just Every, bleeding dude, all over the place. Night, Not even in shows, <laughs> just like look. <laughs> Down the hotel. <laughs> yeah. So just so people know, like New Orleans, like everyone had to take HIV, Hep B and C tests to yeah. work. Like legitimately, yeah. everyone had to take them. Yeah. So like everybody you saw wrestle this weekend, like pass their tests. So blood wars can start again, right? So, yeah. Why not? But I, I don't think let me get up later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I didn't know about this weekend, because we're in New Orleans, obviously. Uh, the pile driver is banned in the this. The pile driver is actually legitimately banned. <laughs> we were not aware of that on Friday night. I know. I was pissed because Brian Alvarez uh, came to our Shimmer show on Saturday, and he was like, he was asking me about the commission and everything, and I was like, yeah, the pile driver is really banned. And he's like, ROH to pile driver. We had like no, I, nobody told us nothing. Yeah. No commission. No. 
in my match, there were, on, alone there were three, yeah. and in the <laughs> match after me, there was at least four. Yeah. And we heard nothing of it, but Saturday, they were like, hey, no Paul Drivers. It was crazy. Like, oh, that was okay. like the one DDT or whatever other head drop or anything like is fine, but yeah. Paul Driver. But then we were debating last night. We were like, well, does that include like the Jerry Lynn style? Pal That's driver? the thing, right? <laughs> like, I feel like there's ways around, around it. Yeah. Like we were like, we were like, well, let's say the guy's got him up for a Paul Driver and the commission's about to run in, but then he hooks it like the Jerry Lynn. The commission goes and sits He's, down. You're good. <laughs> like. Like what? What kind of power? Oh, it's a variation. Is Undertaker gonna be able to do a tombstone on WrestleMania? I, they'll yeah. probably just eat the fine that comes with it. I'm sure they won't mind. But no, they probably the already made it. Here, he's gonna do three. There's a check. Uh, so we fa you fast forward through a lot of stuff, but uh, ECW is done. You think you're done, and then Bring of Honor happens. Yeah, that. Um, well, basically, I went to work for Feinstein on uh -huh. our video. And because um, I, I weasel myself into a job there, sure. Why not? Um, so because uh, basically I I was I had good PR writing skills, promotional writing skills, and he had no one really doing that. His writing was crap on his uh -huh. website, and that's when you know the website was getting important. Yeah. And he still did the mailing catalog and that kind of stuff. So I sold myself on doing the uh, PR and everything there. So um, he hired me, and um, so I went and did that. And you know what saved my ass was WoW Magazine during that whole... Okay. WoW Magazine paid so much money. Do you remember WoW Magazine? World of Wrestling? Yeah. yeah I think I've and there was ECW I, I probably Magazine. probably came a couple times. Oh my god, they paid so much money. It was really? I was getting like $3,000 checks from them and stuff for writing like one article. It's not bad. It was ridiculous. Wow. So that like saved my ass and then I went to work for Feinstein and then... They were struggling because a big part of their business was ECW, mm. and there was no more ECW tapes or shows. It's funny, I was thinking of that in the last night, like how, I don't know why, it just popped in my head, like how did Ring of Honor come about is probably from ECW closing and, and down and then needed something else. Well, he tried to hook up with CZW and JPW, which were good and all, but like it just it wasn't the same, it wasn't doing it. And then like one day we were just like... Um, you know, we've learned all this stuff on our own. Like, why, why aren't we doing it on mm. our own? So, like, it was just supposed to be, like, a once-a-month thing, you know, in Philly to okay. basically, like, have a super hot DVD. And, and or it wasn't even DVD. It was still VHS. Yeah. You know, a super hot VHS tape and, and something to sell and a show to sell money, or a show to sell merch yeah. at and all that kind of stuff to make money. So that that's where it kind of, we were like, let's just do it ourselves. And then, then I just kind of clicked with the booking and like I kind of I, I don't know I, I was a little bit of an asshole and um, but I kind of took control of that a little bit and that's that's where that's okay. how I got to that position okay everything. and then uh, this was 2002 yeah it's 2000 then, but 2001 was when the when the groundwork right. started being but set. the first show was in 2002 February 2002 yeah and uh, it was the Murphy Rec Center the main event was Brian Key. Daniels Key and, and no, those three. Those three? Oh, I yeah. thought it was a four-way. See, it three -way. no, it was a three-way because, see, the thing about ROH is there's a lot of stuff that was, like, real personal to me, you know, with that. And um, the big thing for me with ECW was, like, what made ECW was that Funk, Shane, and, um, and Sabu uh -huh. three-way, the night the line was crossed. Sure. So I kind of, putting that those guys in a three-way was kind of like an ode to that to right. me so it's a very it was like a personal thing you mm -hmm. see i mean there's still like super card of honor that was a purse that's a personal name to me because i grew up watching like the or again the pro wrestling illustrated they'd have the big super card right. magazine so i wanted to replicate that when we did that so that's where i got that name from the newswire which i don't know if they still even call it the newswire no, they call it the uh, honor I don't remember. All right, but the newswire was like. I don't really read it. Anymore. Yeah, <laughs> they still they called it that for years. Still. I don't read it because they make me say weird stuff. <laughs> but um, but uh, that was like a personal thing because my first thing was the ECW Action Wire, so I took the word wire there and everything. But um, yeah, so we wanted the three way because to me that was like a throwback to the ECW three way that made ECW. So so we put that on and 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 even like Doug and Rob were like, you sure you want to do a three way? Like people want to see that, and I was like, yeah, let's just do it. So the first show you booked it. 
The first show. Yeah, yeah. And uh, is there th anything from the first show that you particularly regret booking? Nah, no? Nah, You're nah. happy with the whole thing? I mean, I don't... Is there anything that didn't work at all that you were, at, looking back, wish you hadn't? No, you know I, mean? I mean, I wouldn't open the promotion with that whole Christopher Street stuff if we did it again. <laughs> okay. But that was, like, just the thing that we did to, um, like, because we, we were... We were like presenting like this is gonna be like serious wrestling, serious wrestling. And then we started out with a Christopher Street connection and the Hit Squad coming out, and now it's just kind of throw a curveball like right at the beginning and say, "Hey, don't have really any expectations. Just right. kind of go along for the ride with us." But I don't know if it came off that way or not. I see. You and tell me. I actually never watched the first show. I only okay. saw the main event of the first show. Okay. I never watched because you know, here's the thing about me. Yeah. I got into Ring of Honor. Uh, well. The, the, I, I'll take you through how it happened is in 2004 I I knew what Ring of Honor was but I had never watched it because I was a WWF guy okay. all the way I didn't watch indies I didn't watch WCW I was just WWF WWF and then I trained for wrestling from 2000 to 2003 with Rujo and I wrestled for him but then when he told like when he, I left I finally wanted to start wrestling on the indies and I decided, well, everybody's talking about Ring of Honor, so it seems like that's the place you gotta go to to get noticed in the United States. So, uh, Generico and I, and this guy Beef Wellington, drove up to the Ring of Honor show, and it wasn't Boston, it was around Boston, where Liger wrestled Brian, okay. and Aries against Punk, yep. and we had our little tape with us, and then uh, the show was, and that was my first Ring of Honor show that I'd ever seen, okay. that live show. And then, you know, after the show we asked Punk, because we had seen him at like Jersey All Pro, like, who do we give this to? He's like, that guy over there. That was you. Yeah. We gave you the tape, and that was it. But that was the first show I'd seen. Okay. And then later on, I, you know, I caught up on some stuff here and there because I was working for the company. But, uh, like, I didn't, I, I just knew it was something special, but I never actually watched it. Okay. You know what I mean? Then, so, then when, did you, when did your match with Generico happen, your infamous match? Uh, the first one that you took off the DVD, yeah. uh, that was June 2005. Okay, now have you seen that match since Yes, then? I have. Okay, now what, I don't remember what I hated about it. What would I have hated about that I match? was told okay. that, you, you told me okay. that the only reason you took it off the DVD was because the main event went 60 minutes and you had no room on the DVD. Is that true? That's what you told me. Okay, so maybe I never true. knew if it was true. But the match itself, this is the thing. Okay. Uh, again, we're fast forwarding, but okay. fucking who cares? We can come back to whatever. I'm sorry, am I breaking your format? No, here. I don't have a format. Okay. But I'm just saying, I'm sure we'll come back to right. earlier than that later. But uh, then I want to talk about an angle that you did that I hated. But go ahead. Please, please. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay. this is my ring water experience at the beginning with the game. Now, was that me. your first match for us? No. Okay. No. So you were already. That was our last. That if it of that little run. Okay. That was the last match. Okay. Because what happened is uh, I had started doing CCW with Generico. I had done Jersey All Pro. Then we sent you. We brought you the tape. Okay. And you said you. I remember when we went up to you. You were like, Yeah, I've heard of you guys, but I've never seen you. I'll watch this and get back to you. Yeah. A month later, you called me. And you're like, Hey, we have a spot at Final Battle. We need somebody to be masked. Uh, weapon of destruction uh, against okay. Jay Lethal, and you know, we want you to do it, and then February we'll give you a match on Do or Die, okay. which is the afternoon card. Yeah, so it's like okay, but then I got hurt a couple weeks before Final Battle, okay. and Generico ended up doing it instead of me. Okay, but I was at the Final Battle, and like Aries beat Joe, and it was craziness, and okay. I was like, oh my god, like this is awesome, like because that was my second show, you know what I mean? Okay, like I gotta, we gotta wrestle here. So February came, we did Do or Die. There was the whole T-shirt talk. You remember that? No, I think that got overblown, but because I don't. Well, think... no, the punk thing is okay. what made that whole All right, thing happen. Punk, I don't. Let's take. I'll take uh, you through things as I remember okay. them, because I have a pretty good memory of that stuff. Okay. Before the do or die, you just told me he's like, listen, it's like, uh, you know, in Ring of Honor, guys just don't really wear T-shirts. So if you could, you you weren't even like you can't wear a T-shirt. You were yeah. just like, if you could find something else, probably be better. So okay, I had like this. I had the singlet already. I just had like a logo stitched on it, and then. Right. I did the do or die match with my, without my shirt on. It was the first time I'd wrestled without a shirt on anywhere, just in a singlet. And I kind of felt like I looked like an asshole. Yeah. I don't think I looked that bad, but I didn't look great either. But whatever, I did the match with B-Boy, who I love B-Boy, but we never worked that great together. So the match was okay, you know yeah. what I mean? Nothing amazing, but it was okay. Generic had some four-way, and that went well too. And then when we came back, we were like, oh, you guys will get more bookings. And then I think it was almost immediately like, you, you guys are going to be in the trios tournament or something. Okay. Which was a month later. Okay. And then uh, I think I remember you telling me that I would be on a team with Brian, 
Danielson and James Gibson. And I was like, that is incredible. Okay. And then you immediately changed it almost. Uh, right, like the right. next day, you're like, oh no, you're in a six way scramble now. Right. So we ended up teaming with Gibson and Brian on there. Um, I don't know. Oh, and no, it was Spanky and Gibson, and it would have been me, Spanky, and Gibson, but it ended up being Spanky, Gibson, and. Uh, All right. Vordell Walker. No, Vordell was on the Oh, he was with Joe, Joe and Brian. It was somebody there. But anyway, you, I remember you telling me that, and I was blown away. I'm like, oh my God, I'm on a team with these guys? Yeah. And then I did it. I was in the six foot scramble with Special J. <laughs> but uh, that was fine. Uh, so we did that match, and it was okay. And then April came, and it was like, we got booked once a month. You booked us for like one show a month in yeah. that little run. A April, Generico, I think, wrestled Homicide. Okay. And I wrestled Bordell Walker. Okay. And that was the t-shirt incident night. So that night was terrible for me. Uh, okay. Because uh, a week before the show, I asked you, like, can I just wrestle in my t-shirt? I don't feel comfortable without it. And people weren't... People weren't exactly blown away with my Ring of Honor run so far. Like, I would read the message boards and I was just getting trashed. Like, this guy can't fucking work here. <laughs> At the same time, I was in PWG and people loved me there. So I was like, what am I fucking doing wrong here? I don't get it. And I had that match with Bordeaux. I did the... T I asked you about the t-shirt, and this is where I suspect you had to tell Punk that I asked you about wrestling in a t-shirt. Okay. Because the afternoon, as soon as I got there, Punk made a comment to me about wrestling in a t-shirt. So I was like, well, <laughs> I guess that got back to him somehow. Okay. And then uh, I had a terrible match with Wardell Walker. Yeah. Just <laughs> fucking abysmal. And I came to the back. And uh, I don't know. I made a snide comment to Punk about my t-shirt. And he lost it on me. You didn't see the... Uh, I didn't see any of You were of this. there, right? Yeah. All I did and was... And this I, was at the Rexplex? Or no, was it? Uh, it was like... in. Braintree, maybe? Or no? So that was a small building. Yeah. It's the a night, flex, I missed everything. It was the it was night so that, uh, that same night, Punk had like the crazy brawl with Jimmy Rave all over the okay. building. Yeah. All right. Anyway, uh, I, I came to the back and I was blown. And Punk was just there watching me. And I don't know why. I was like, are you happy now? But I was like joking around with him. Yeah. He did not take it as a joke. He just stood up. And I remember this. I remember he stood up and he looked around. And I knew what he was going to do. Yeah. I, I was, we had this weird moment. I'm like, Please don't do it. And he's like, no, no, I have to. So it was like weird. It was like he was warning me. He's like, I, I have to. I'm, I, it's like he was telling me, I'm just doing this. This is a show. He's like, no, I have to. And he just starts screaming at me in the locker room. And everybody turned and just looked at me. And then I was like, what do I do now? And I just went. You should have punched him in the face, dude. Dude, I, <laughs> I thought about shoving him as hard as I could. Because right That's what would have happened back in the day. <laughs> well, right. But yeah. I... Like, at that point, I was like, I want to be here so bad, and yeah. he's really making me look like an asshole, but, like, I could see a, there was a, it was, it was weird, there was weight, like, equipment, right, all around us, I could see a bench press right behind, like, a bench. Yeah. If I had shoved him, he would have taken a bump. I got, yeah. I, at this, that's the first thing, I'm like, do I just fucking shove this guy? And yeah. then I'm like, I can't do that. And also, I was friends with Colt, kind of, at that yeah. point, and I didn't want, and then I saw Homicide with his t-shirt right there, and yeah. I felt like going... Yell at him too. Yeah. But I both both choices would have been, been horrible. That would have been a bad. So choice. I just went. You know what? I, I stopped. I'm like, okay, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah. And that was it. I completely bitched out. Okay. Completely. That had nothing to do. So then that was probably what April, and then this generic match was. That was the last match of this. That was June. That in was May, June. we weren't booked. Okay. Because I remember talking to you after the, the next day. I'm like, hey, the thing that happened with Punk, you were like, I don't even know what happened, and I don't care. It's no problem. Okay. So that's that generic match, me. was it bad, or was it... I don't think so. Okay. Ring of Honor put it on a DVD. Like, they did compilations now for yeah. it, and they put it on, and I, that's, that was the first time I got to watch it. And uh, I don't think it was bad. There was one fuck-up in it. Okay. I just Generico. remember... And maybe it was like this... Maybe it was kind of like you were teetering because, as you were just saying, it wasn't the greatest run at that point. No, and that was kind of. I know. felt like I I don't know if you remember or not, but I felt like when you put us against each other, yeah, that was a huge test. Where and you wanted to see, are we gonna balls out in the opener, or, or are we gonna be smart? And then me and Snarko, I remember thinking, should we just go balls out, or yeah. should we be smart? Like what what? And nobody was talking to us, and Punk even came to us like. He's like, look, I want you guys to do good, but have a brain. So we're like, God damn it. But we were thinking, like, when we went to CZW and we did that four-way, that was our first match in the United States, we did everything we could, and that's what got us on the fucking map. Yeah. So do we just throw a Hail Mary and hope for the best, or do we go conservative? We went the conservative way, which wouldn't have been that bad, but the problem is literally a minute in, 
Janarko went for a leapfrog, and fucking, I went, oh, and for some reason, yeah, it probably tripped probably on me. It probably, it wouldn't be so much that you guys had to go out there and steal the show, but, like, it had to be, like, just a super solid, it was, everything look good. And but it was probably, okay. But if you were kind of teetering at that point with the yeah. run, like you said, it wasn't the best, and then, that to me, that's a layup. Like, I'm doing you and Generico. You know, that, I'm wrong, actually. It wasn't our last, but keep going. Okay, yeah. but that's a layup, so that might have been, like, all right, that didn't go so great, so let's take a break. If it had been point. me now, yeah. like, if I, obviously, I could say that if I knew then what I know now, but I obviously wouldn't. I would, we would have went balls out yeah. in the opener, and we would have been like, fuck it. I don't know if balls out would have done it, you know what I'm saying? It would have just I, had to be where I think it would have done well. more for us than being conservative. Yeah. Now, you know balls I'm like, out people, is what got you guys back, because yeah. we had that spot. Yeah. That was the tag with Because the that's when you told us. Go nuts. And yeah. we're like, fuck yeah, that's it. Yeah. But at that point, you weren't telling us anything. You just said, have a good match. So yeah. we're like, fuck, now what would we do? Anyway, so we had the match. And then uh, that was it. Like, But August, I just remember now, you booked us for one last shot in August. And I remember, uh, I remember, like, I didn't know what I was in Ring of Honor. Yeah. Like, I knew what I was in PWG. I was a fucking asshole. But in Ring of Honor, you had never given me an indication of whether I was a heel or a face oh, or I anything. I didn't have any problem right. at that point. So... August, that last, for some reason, it's like, it was in Buffalo. I think I knew this is our last show. Like, I just felt it from yeah. you, maybe. So it was a four. It was me, Jimmy, Davey Andrews, and Chad Collier. Okay. And uh, I remember Chad Collier, when we were calling the match, just told us, like, like we need something to make this interesting. Yeah. Because we had, like, he's like, the wrestling's fine, but just... And I told Chad, I'm like, I'm just going to be an asshole out there. And he's like, Okay. So that match was the first time I showed any personality in Ring of Honor. Yeah. And I think I got more over that night than I ever did in those first six months. But I think the damage had been done already. You know what I mean? And we might need a little break. Obviously, uh, you guys are brought back. So Well, you told us. Like that. That's when you told us, okay, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll let you guys know if you Sometimes have anything. Sometimes it happens that way, TC. It sucks. I know it sucks being a talent because... Like, you want to just get on the show and get an angle and be booked and blah, blah, of blah. Of course. But sometimes just the, the spot's not there. Yeah. So you come in, you do some stuff, and it's like, okay, I know what you can do. We don't have the spot. Because I always say it's like a baseball team. You can have, like, four awesome shortstops, so it doesn't do you any good because you can only play one. Uh -huh. You know, there's only so many spots on the show I see, and different things. I see what you mean. But at the time, like, me and Generico were like, well, that was a failure. We chalked it up as being a failure. And, I mean, it's not a huge success because if you do come in and you're like yeah you know because we this is the thing in our brain things were snowballing just as they should yeah we did CW once they loved it we did Jersey All Pro they want to bring us back then we got PWG PWG we were in right away yeah next logical step is Ring of Honor yeah but it didn't work yeah so we were like what the fuck so I remember for a bit we were like man I can't believe we didn't get in and at the same time at that point we had gotten closer to Colt and Colt was telling us like eh, you know just keep trying so we keep messaging you especially Generico but then we were doing PWG and we were so over there yeah. that eventually we were like, and then we started getting booked, you know, in Europe and stuff like that. And we we're like, fuck, we got to the point where we we're like, maybe we don't need Ring of Honor. You know what I mean? Like yeah. maybe this is not for us. Until like the CZW angle happened and then you use Super Dragon for yeah. a show. Yeah. And we we're like, well, fuck now. If he's going to go, we want to go. You yeah. know what I mean? So I remember like we, put, like we started messaging you again and I was like asking you about... Can I do like my own angle in CZW because Iron Man champion? That's a, and I, I here's the thing: I hated CZW so much, yeah, so much. And I was like, what if I'm just the one guy from CZW who wants to fucking go? And I remember asking you, like, is it okay if I do? And you're like, do whatever you want. Yeah, and I'm I did. so pissed. Because why I didn't was you saying, tell me? Because you, why didn't you say no? Because I'm not going to say no to your idea. Why? Because I was respectful I, enough to ask I you. I know. It was cool. And that actually, that was really cool. But then why were you pissed that I did Because it? I was saving that angle because I wanted someone in ROH to do it with WWE. But if you came up with the angle and had a place to do it for... Here's the whole thing like Raven, when I because I learned a lot from him back in the day. And Raven would be like, when you get an idea for an angle, just... Or when you get any idea, just do it. Because someone else is going to come up with yeah, the same yeah, idea yeah. and just do it. So to me, it was like, okay, I came up with the idea. I, I was actually waiting for Brian Kendrick. I was going to do it okay. with him. And... Um, and we didn't have a chance to do it, and you came to me with that, and I go, all right, well, he came up with it. I, I, that's not cool. Yeah, but you could know, have still I know done I yours. I said no, but I didn't think it was cool. But mine was happening in CCW where barely anybody was watching. At that point, yeah. if, unless Ring of Honor was involved on the show, barely anyone yeah, was watching. Yeah, it was still happening. But I, but I wasn't pissed at you. Like That wasn't like me being pissed at you. That was me being pissed at myself. In my head, I was like, 
fuck it. I'm going to do it. I'm, like, I asked you, you said yes. I'm like, okay, I'm going to make this fucking angle so good. He's yeah. going to have to bring me back. <laughs> it didn't turn out that way at all. No, but I obviously liked you because if I didn't like you, I wouldn't let you use the... Yeah, I did appreciate name. that. Yeah, I wouldn't let you use Because it. at that point, too, me and Gennaro kept asking you, like, do you have any dates yet? And you're like, no, no. So we were like, man, fuck, maybe... Uh, I obviously... Like I wanted to stay on good terms with you because if yeah. I didn't, if I didn't, I would have been like, no, dude, that's not cool to use the ROH name. And, uh, nah, like, ah, don't do the angle. Right. But, like, but like, I was like, okay, you came up with the idea. I didn't get a chance to execute it. I'm not going to be a dick. Like, go mm, ahead and do I it. See. Go ahead and do it. And um, and I probably knew at that point you guys would be coming back for another shot eventually anyway. That, that was always the feeling we had. But, yeah. like, you know, you never said there was never any time frame or anything. Like, but we never asked until Generico eventually did. But we had never bothered to ask what should we do for you to want us back. Yeah. Until Generico eventually did. And I remember he did because... Cabana told us like that was great. Like Gabe loved that. Like I guess he emailed you and yeah. asked you, and you. I guess you really like like that he went to that length. You know, just asking, is there anything we can do? Yeah. And then uh, you know, more time passed, and I it was still doing PWG, and then I went to Japan, and while I was in Japan, you booked Generico to like for a show, and I was like, oh my god, Generico is gonna get the Ring of Honor, and I'm not. Yeah. I was so bummed out, and that's when I was like, you know what, fuck Ring of Honor. Like in Japan, I was totally in like. Fuck ROH, I don't give a shit about them. <laughs> I wasn't even reading the results, even though I totally was. And then uh, I remember I remember telling my girlfriend, like, ah, fuck Ring of Honor, I don't care. Let, <laughs> let Generico do it, I don't care. Good for him, but I don't give a shit, I don't need him. And then I so almost as soon as I came back, he said, hey, do you want to wrestle the Briscoes in February? I was like, yes. Was that February that match? It's February, this is the okay. anniversary show. And I remember okay. I was at a restaurant when I got your email. It was like, or a text, or whatever. Yeah. I'm like, oh. Ring of Honor wants me to go in February. It's just like, I thought you didn't care. I'm like, oh, I'm fucking lying. I totally do. Because <laughs> I just remember we needed a tag team for the first coach. Yeah. And then you guys had like an awesome match. Like that match was just yeah. like. You gave yeah. us but fucking the Briscoes. Yeah. They're the reason that we got in because yeah. they were so down. Well, you guys are right there, obviously. So yeah, like, but they were, you know, they could have been like, they were the Briscoes. They could have been like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a bit. But they could have been dicks. Yeah. But they weren't. Yeah, they're not going to be no, but, but, you know um, what I mean. but I just remember it was like like it made the whole undercard that match. It was so you know? fun. Yeah, like so like, fun. So then at that point, like at that point you guys are gold. Right? Yeah, as soon as you walk through the curtain, you're like, oh you're, you're on everything. Like, yeah. Fuck. Yeah, yeah. Finally. Yeah. Uh I remember crying after. Really? I called my wife, I was crying because that See, was that the put biggest so much pressure thing. on me, dude. Like but, people are like, Yeah, but don't you like that the fact that you had brought the company to that point is yeah. amazing. That it meant that it's, much. It's a people. weird thing. It's hard to explain because then it puts a great deal of pressure because it's like I I'm trying to figure out how to say it. Like, it's just weird being in the spot where it's like I don't I don't get off like being like, oh, you're in and you're out mm -hmm. and, and that kind of stuff. And for like it to mean that much to somebody, like I, I do feel a lot of pressure because it's like, I don't want people to, to like, to, like you, you do like, I don't want to like have that much importance or I don't I know know. What you I'm mean. having a hard time yeah, saying yeah. it. You I know, know what you mean. mean. You don't want to have that much impact on someone's life indirectly. Like, yeah, yeah, it's just but, it's a weird thing. Yeah, know? but that's, I mean, if you didn't, then you wouldn't be your job, like, you wouldn't have been doing your job correctly because you want that. Yeah. You want people to fucking die. But that away. was like Mick Foley. Like, I remember him, he really pushed that, like, like, and I, you know, I'm just, I'm really, you know, I'm down here on the Indies. I, I'm, I'm way low on the totem pole, but he was like, you know, you do, like, you have people's careers, like, you're juggling with people's careers, so if you come up and you put them in, like, tons of crappy stuff or whatever, like, you know, you're having an effect on their lives, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it's, you know, it is, it's a, I know some people get off on that, you know, but yeah, like, yeah. I, it's just, it's pressure. To you, it's pressure. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's a good way of seeing it, probably. Yeah. So anyway, we've talked about our beginning and everything, but like, through those first years, or through the entire run in Ring of Honor, before we touch on other stuff, like, from the start, from 2002 to, you know, 2000, what was it, seven? 2000, no, eight or nine, right? 2008, 2008. yeah. 2008, like, uh, what's October, the... October, I was fired October 24th. Was that after an Edison? Want to hear a weird thing? Edison, yeah, please. Want to hear a weird thing? This is weird. Is I was fired October 24th, 2000, and uh, was it 24th or 20, 24th? Um, I remember it was at the night of an Edison show. Yeah, was it the 24th? Whatever. whatever. Uh -huh. One year later, by Carrie, okay? Uh -huh. One year later, one day off, 
my son was born and midwife was named Carrie. Really? Yeah, isn't that like a weird thing? <laughs> I always thought that was like a weird... It's kind of funny. It was like a weird thing. So, but whatever. It's funny how things work out sometimes. So, through those uh, six years there, uh, I'm sure there's so many moments that stick out as good or bad. Yeah. Do you want to go through a few of the good ones? Because the bad ones are usually kind of more yeah. interesting, but I don't know. You know what's weird is like the Ring of Honor stuff to me at this point. It's just kind of like it's another life. It's it's another life, and it's kind of like. But it was still your creation. I would have to go if I went through and watched each show again. I know I'd sit there and remember like boom boom. Right. I'd no, remember no, I, so much stuff. I'd I'd remember stuff about every promo and every match right. and just stuff leading up to the show and after the show. But in order to do that, I'd have to watch it like like I'd have to watch every single show. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean the good parts. I mean. There was just like, I mean, there were so many good parts, but then there was like, it got to the point when, when all that stuff went down in 2004 with Feinstein and everything, it, it was, it, it, it wasn't the same for me yeah. at that point. It became, it, 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 even my wife says like, it took a lot of love out of doing the whole thing yeah. for me. Then it was kind of more about survival at that I point see. after all that. So, but I mean, there was like a lot of, I don't know. I mean, I, it's hard for me to just come up with like, I don't know, ask me a question. I'll try to come I mean, up I like from all the moments that while I was there, I saw like the Aries beating Joe. Was, that was awesome. Right. That was awesome. That was and like incredible. Yeah. Yeah. That was, um, that was, um, I, I remember, okay. Leading up to that. Right. I was like, I knew Joe's title reign had to end. It wasn't going to go on Punk. Uh, the obvious thing would have been to go to Punk, but it wouldn't have done anything for anybody. To me, it was a chance to make a new guy. Right? Yeah, of course. And like, leading up to that, I was like, we just, I don't know who this guy is. That's going to be Joe, you know? And um, and it wasn't supposed to happen until the anniversary show. For some reason, we pushed it up. I'm sure there's, because I think we rushed the Punk match. Oh, because the Carino no showed. And we had to rush the second Joe Punk match. And then we had to rush the third Joe Punk mm -hmm. match. And then after the whole Joe Punk trilogy, was over that was it the Joe's title run was over right. there's nothing left to do with it okay. so then um, we had to uh, so then it was like alright now we have to end it we don't have a guy to end it with right now like, right. I wasn't sure who it was and what happened was we had the first FIP weekend down in Florida and Sal hired made a book there uh -huh. it's like a side gig and now it's in September and um, we ended up uh, Aries came down he was just really getting established with us and Punk and uh, there's a hurricane that weekend. We got stuck at the airport for like a day or two. Like we were living at the airport, it's me, Punk, and Aries, right? And um, that's when I really got to know Aries. And to me, a huge thing, like push, when you push somebody, you're obviously looking at talent, but you also have to be able to trust the guy, uh -huh. okay? So that's when I got to know Aries, and I'm like, all right, this dude, like he carries himself like a, a star. Or not yet, but he, I can tell he has the ability that he's going to learn mm -hmm. to carry himself as a star. Seems like a good dude. I trust him. I'm getting a good sense about him. He's got the talent. And that's when the call was made to really go to Aries. Okay. So it wasn't until September. We knew like the title reign had to end. He had been there. He started in March. Long, right? Yeah, it started in May or something. Or May was Generation Next when he really started. March, I think he did a do or die show. Okay. So, um, so, uh, but yeah, so that's how he kind of became the guy was we were stuck in that, the airport in the hurricane. I got to know him and I was like, all right, this dude we can trust with the bell and everything. And then Joe just did such a phenomenal job putting him over with that ending sequence and everything. Unbelievable. I mean, now it's just magic that, Amazing. that and, and that's all them, you know, putting together that right. and everything. And then uh, I was watching in the back by the curtain and everything and everyone was going nuts. I mean, it was like a really like. Uh, you know, emotional thing. I, I grabbed uh, Alice in Danger and I was like, I like was hoisting her up and everything, I'll get her and everything. Yeah. It was like, it was like that special. No, it was crazy, man. Yeah. I remember it. I was in the, like in the bleachers. It was just unreal. Yeah. Um, so, all right, we've talked about like the Ring of Honor run a lot. There's just one little thing I want to bring up before we move on. Uh, I got to ask you, because that's, it was me. It was you. When we did the two out of three falls with the Briscoes, me and Generico, remember they were doing the two straight thing? Okay. We really thought we were gonna get, we were gonna be the team to get that one fall with Briscoes. I'm so glad you didn't. But go ahead. Why? Because because okay, was, the last my last great moment booking Ring of Honor was when you and Generico won the tag titles. Sure, that, that was, was amazing. That was my yes. last in Boston. I'm about to ask right? you about that okay. too. By the, the way, but that was because that last weekend I had was. A I felt I felt like that was almost on par with uh, Aries beating Joe. There it was, was less a, people it was at the a show. Special moment. It was fucking real. Yeah, that's the thing that I remember from uh, Aries beating Joe. 
every the moment one, two, three happened, everybody forgot that they knew that was gonna happen. That's my and that's the same thing with Generico and I winning the belts. It's like everyone forgot that this was a this was fake. It was like, oh my god, they won for real. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. And that uh, that was my last like great moment booking like yeah. Ring of Honor was that. And it was special to me too because it was in Boston where I grew up. Yeah. And actually where BU is, it's not that far from mm -hmm. where I grew up. So it was like my home area and we had a legitimately special moment yeah. and everything. So I think if you guys went over or took the one fall from the brisket, and that gimmick didn't work anyways. But that was over a year before. Yeah. So. You don't, like, because here's the thing. I, when, when we didn't get the one fall, I was fine with it until yeah. I saw who got the one fall on the Briscoes, which was in December. Who was it, Rocky? It was Rocky and Roddy for, no, like, I was like, why because did they get to, to take the one fall? Yeah, I think who I wanted, I wanted to push them or something. But the gimmick didn't work anyways. I got no reaction when I got the one fall. No, so, but I think it would have gotten a reaction if we had gotten it. But I think then it would have given you guys. Uh, just the fact that you were in such denial. You think the fact that you think the fact that we didn't get that one fall in the Briscoes like led to us winning the belts bi was bigger. Yeah, that's what you think. Yeah, okay. I, I'll stand by. Fair it. enough. I mean, I never yeah. thought of it that way. Yeah, right. yeah. So because so, then it's like you guys didn't get shit until you got that moment, right. you know. And then it was like that moment was was so much earned, and it was you know it's kind of I guess similar to what's going on with Brian right now. Sure. You know. Yeah. So it was kind of like. I like it sometimes when people say the booking sucks. Like you gotta, right. as a booker, you gotta, you can't be afraid of having people say the booking sucks because, because you book something that you know. That's how you not, end up getting the biggest reward. Because you're right? telling a story. You know. I felt uh, like I, I remember when Chris Benoit won the title at WrestleMania. Yeah. Um, you know that was back in the day when everybody was like, "Oh, Triple H just buries everybody. Fuck Triple H. He's the worst." Yeah. I remember when fucking he tapped to Benoit. Yeah. Like I remember Benoit had him in the crossface. I remember watching, like, come on, just fucking tab, just fucking tab, don't bury him. Yeah. And then he rolled over, and I was like, he's not, but then they rolled back into the crossroads, and then he tapped, and great, like, greatest reaction ever. Yeah. I was like, in my head, I was like, Triple H is the smartest fucking guy ever. Yeah. For years, he built this reputation as the piece of shit who won't put people over, and now that he did, it's a giant deal. Yeah. So it goes along the same. But lines, you can't you know be I mean? afraid. I think too many. You can't be afraid to. You get can't be shit. afraid of taking the heat. Right? You can't be afraid of people going, "Oh, you're a shitty booker because you didn't give them what they want right at that moment." If you believe in the story you're telling and you've mapped out that story, you know there's going to be parts where, all right, people are going to fucking hate this, uh -huh. and they're going to go on message boards or Twitter or whatever it is and say how much you suck. Yeah. And if you can't take that heat, you shouldn't be a part of this job. Right. Because at the time, that's not like a personal insult or insult. I hate them. You know, people insult you personally. It's like, all right, that's yeah, just that's, stupid yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just stupid shit. I never, ever get mad at people going, oh, I don't, the booking sucked or whatever, because that's all opinion. I hate it when people state things they get the booking wrong and they state their opinion as fact because mm -hmm. they're not really following the story or they're missing a part or they're just stating their opinion as fact that pisses me off but if you state an opinion you go Gabe's booking sucks especially me I'm a polarizing booker like I the, the lot of stuff I book is polarizing mm -hmm. that's cool because all the artists I always love are polarizing yeah but you don't you don't want to I, I, I'm with you on that like you never want people to just be kind of lukewarm about shit yeah I'd rather they hate me to fucking yeah. see me they want to see me die yeah or love me and they want to marry me on the spot than yeah. just being yeah, he's all right. But you know there's I mean? parts where you know that they're going to hate this or they're going to think this dude's underpushed or or I'm not giving them exactly what they want right now and I'm going to take heat for that. And if you can't do that, like, th that's the wrong job for you. You got to yeah. take that because in the end, you're going somewhere with everything, you yeah. know? And then those message board fucks can get real, like, can, I remember one, for me, I remember one particular on the Ring of Honor message board. It was, uh, I was, you know, like, you gave me a little run, I think, at the beginning of 2008, where I, I, I had turned babyface, and you gave me, like, a little streak of singles wins, and I beat, a, like, a couple big names, and uh, I remember one fan wrote, it's, like, on the message board, the title of the thread was, time for, uh, time for Gabe, or time to pull the trigger on Kevin Steen, and then when you open the thread, it said, I think it's time to give him the world title, and yeah. another fan wrote, yeah, time to pull the trigger, dot, dot, dot. And put the bullet right between his eyes. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. My wife read it. She's like, I'm going to fucking write it. I'm like, no, you're not. And I have to like pull the laptop away from her. Yeah. Who fucking says that? Yeah. I don't like his fucking leapfrog, so I want to kill yeah, him. I want to shoot Jesus. him in the head. But, uh, yeah. What's the worst thing you read about yourself on a message board? Uh, like the thing that made you go like, fuck this. Like... 
you know, nothing's coming to mind. No, no, no. Holy no. shit, I have so many that I remember kinda, reading. Like, I just, that's the top one. I kind of, you just kind of let it go, you know. Yeah, but that, that one for some reason stayed with me like in a no. Yeah, that's kind of fucked up. I just can't up. believe that's, it. That's kind of fucked up. You know, I just I just hate it when people take their opinion and state as fact. Yeah, I see what you, you know, mean. Like that 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 gets annoying. Right. You know? It's not I think this. It's this is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. This is what it is. And they do it in a way where they're trying to like sway opinion and kind of make it uncool for people to think the opposite way. Yeah. Right. Know? Right. So like that's that's not cool. You know. Um, but you can say like I think this book, you know, this sucks or whatever. I'll be like, all right. You know. That's, yeah. That's like I, like. It'll people happen. are entitled to their opinion. Yeah. And Nobody like, will you're like not booking everything. everything, so people are going to like everything. Sure. Anyways, you know? So things with Ring of Honor ended, and then uh, I think I remember talking to you, and I think you were telling me, ah, oh, I think I'm done with wrestling. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You thought that. Yeah. Well, then um, then what happened at that point? Well, first, Brian... We lost touch a bit there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots of people lost touch. I, I mean, I kept it... I think we talked... A like, little bit, Once yeah. a bit, but then, and, you know, eventually I went on my life and you went on with yours, and then the next time we talked was when you announced that, like, Dragon Gate was coming and stuff, yeah. or Evolve, maybe? What came first? It's Dragon, Dragon Gate, Gate because the Japanese came to us because uh, they wanted to run WrestleMania weekend because that was like a thing for them. You yeah, know? yeah, like, they, they like doing their six man. Yeah, right? they came over here and that was a thing. And then, um, then we came back with the the idea of uh, of um, yo, know, well, why can't we just do like six weekends a year or something? You know, mm -hmm. we do like six dream cards. You know, we do Philly, New York, Chicago. Everyone gets one or two shows a year, and. Um, and we just do like these crazy dream cards, you know, with the Japanese coming in mm -hmm. six times a year. So then they're like, oh, that sounds cool. So that kind of grew up. Now, the other thing is like, when I was, my last year of the Ring of Honor, or my last couple of years, I was really in a bubble, like wrestling wise. Like I hated Chikar, I didn't understand it. <laughs> you know, I like, um, uh, like I understand like, going on another thing, like Cornette, uh, we can talk about that a little too if you want. But um, I talked about him way too much uh, okay. already, to be honest. But uh, no, but like I understand his point of view about you and Generico and Cabana and stuff. I'm not saying I agree with no, it. No, I understand but, it too. Yeah. But I think that the fact he's so close-minded about it. That's is what it what's is. It's up. being close-minded, yeah. and that's the same way I was. I mean, even Generico, I didn't get the gimmick for a while, and no. like, and and like, you know, with him, he's like, I want this 100% serious wrestling, and then, you know, a lot of that. But whatever. So like, Chikar, I I hated. Because I didn't get it, and I was getting all this buzz and whatever, and um, and I didn't really know the guys outside the guys we booked because we had so many guys, you know, mm -hmm. and like I just I, I wasn't watching any tapes or anything. So then I started. I went to Chikara. That was the first shows that like I went to afterwards, and I was like, oh, it was like a mind, like yeah. my mind was blown. You know, I was like, holy shit, like there's this, this is incredible. I had know? a similar moment. It took me longer though. Yeah. I hated Chikara too, and I'd wrestled for them, but yeah. I hated it. Yeah, I just didn't get it, and. Quackenbush was mad at me because I swore on one of his shows really loud and <laughs> it just, things weren't good. And then a couple years ago, or two years ago, a year ago, I, he ended up booking me for a show and I hadn't watched anything and I went. And it was me and the Bucks and the Briscoes and it was like a whole big, it was the Cybernetico, it was like in New York. Yeah. And that night, I got it. I was yeah. like, holy fuck, this is awesome. This place is great. And that's the genius of Chikara, too. That's a compliment. When people hate something at first... And then and, end up loving and, and it. And then yeah. loving it. That's a huge compliment. Like, that compliment. was one of my favorite moments of that yeah. year was that Chikara show. Yeah. I loved it. That's that's art when people yeah. do that. Yeah. And, like, that first show... There's, I, I, I'll go back to a mind-blowing moment that I had before Ring of yeah. Honor. This actually paved the way for Ring of Honor in the beginning. Uh -huh was um, ECW, we were in the bubble of ECW, and then um, Doug Gentry was like, you gotta come to this, uh, and Doug, I miss him all the time. But he was like, uh, and that's one of my biggest regrets, how that all ended mm -hmm. in life. But um, anyway, so Doug was like, you gotta see these guys. So we went to CZW in a firehouse in Smyrna, Delaware, and it was the, the Briscoes and Rick Blade <laughs> against the SAT in red, and uh -huh. six man. And like, they did stuff like, it was just unbelievable. I remember like, watching the highlight videos yeah. on like ccwrestling.de, like the German <laughs> website. And I yeah. used to get my fucking mind blown with that. And it was like nothing like I'd ever seen in ECW, even with all the great stuff yeah. in ECW. It was like these six new guys just doing like this new thing, you know? And like that's when we were starting like, man, we, sh we could really start doing something on our own, you know? <laughs> that, that was an eye opening moment. But it was the same thing when I was done with ROH and I went to that Jakar show and I was like, Wow, there's all this other stuff out there, and then like I started discovering like all this other new talent and everything, and like because I started watching other stuff which yeah. I hadn't done in a while, right. and then I was like, wow, all these guys are awesome. And then uh, Brian Danielson, he was there for me, and we actually um, 
we, we, we started talking about, because he came to me, he was like, you know, I think this whole like Ring of Honor style is done, you know, mm -hmm. like, because it was done. It was like everyone had seen, like, it was like ECW towards the end, you know, yeah, yeah. it was like, all right, everyone had seen the style for several years now, and there was much more. And so we started talking, and um, we were actually in talks with Paul Heyman. We actually had a movie producer. I was actually, I was in this dude's house, his, his condo in okay. Manhattan with Paul. And like the dude had pictures with like him and like Heather Graham. And I mean, this guy was legit. And mm -hmm. I, I thought it was gonna happen where we were. I mean, we were gonna have millions to start rolling this out with. And uh, but that that didn't happen. Didn't but anyways, Brian and I started talking. And then th then with all this new talent, we were like, all right, well, we'll do this evolve thing. And um, I think Brian was discontent about some things too. I don't know. Um, but um, but uh, I didn't think how he, he liked the way things went down with me and Carrie. Mm -hmm. or, but um, but we were gonna start that. So then so then but then Brian got signed yeah. right before that. But then we were like, all right, well, there's all these like awesome new guys, and uh, so then we started evolve. That and, was the one thing about you in Ring of Honor, though, is I felt like you always knew which new guys and when you know what I mean when to use who. And uh, I feel like after you left, when Adam took over, no disrespect to Adam, but I feel like you were very good at keeping Ring of Honor an elite place. Well, I think the, the biggest mistake that was made when I was fired was if you're going to change the booker, and it wasn't just like I was a booker, I was... Yeah, you, you were know more, more than did. that, sure. Uh, you, know, you know what I did there. Yeah. Um, you're doing it because you're not happy with the product, and instead of trying to continue that product with some changes, the, if I was Adam, the first thing I would have done is like fired a quarter of the guys in that locker mm. room because you're coming in, you're coming in, you don't know. See, the other thing is here I am, okay? I'm dealing with this pay-per-view thing, which I didn't believe in anyways. And I've made promises to everybody. I made promises to Eric Stevens. I've made promises to Brent Albright. I've made promises to, to all these guys. And I'm trying to do the right thing by everybody and we're overbooking everything. Mm -hmm. There's too many guys and, and whatever. But if you come in as a new booker, you come in with a clean slate, you made no promises to anybody. Right. You come in and be like, you, like if I went to Ring of Honor right now, I'm just saying as an example, no, no, which I'm not fine. saying I would. No, no. You go down the locker and go one, two, three, four, five, Sorry, dude. Sure. Like, I got no relationship with you guys, and here's five fresh guys to bring in. You instead of coming in and trying to keep going, what I was doing, it was an opportunity to say, okay, well, let's hit the reset button. And I kept waiting for Adam to do it because I wasn't watching it, but I was reading the results, and it never seemed like the reset button was. It was hit. never pushed. Yeah. If anything, it was pushed in the mentality. Like they tried to change the mentality of how it worked, but everybody stayed the same. And that's what I was saying is I felt like you were very good at keeping Ring of Honor a, a, an elite, like an elite feel to it because you wouldn't just give dark matches or trap matches to anybody. But Adam was just way more open about that, which I don't think is necessarily bad or like Adam just wanted to give people a chance, but a lot of those guys should have never gotten the chance. See, they that's weren't where you ready. See, but see, that's where I also pride myself. See, you'll see like, I get this from other promoters and bookers, Ian Rodden being one. Um, where they'll be like, oh, why does Gabe get all the credit for Discovery Punk and Cabana, which I never, I never go and I say discovered those mm -hmm. guys, right? But the point is, is that you have all these promotions like Ian. Ian would use anybody that works. Yeah, for, anybody that would do it. That would drive time. in or whatever. So, of course, if you take 100 guys, five of them are going to end up being stars. Uh -huh. It doesn't mean you discovered them. It just means that you booked 100 guys and, and you lucked out five on. times. Yeah, right? and, and not that you lucked out, but okay, because he did of. recognize they were talented, and then he right. did push and build them, but it's not like that there was a cut made to uh -huh. get there, you know? They got there right. because they were willing to work. And whenever people came and worked, and even now I pride myself with Evolve and Dragon Gate, people come to us, it means that you've stood out on that level. It's not just, okay, well, you're willing to drive in for a car. I mean, there's guys that sometimes get in shows, but they don't last like that, mm -hmm. you know? But it means that you've made kind of a cut, and that's why I think I get this credit that a lot of the other promoters and bookers elsewhere are like, oh, what's Gabe your credit? I was using that guy first. But yeah, you're using him first because you're using 50 other guys sure. first, and he happened to stick. But when he came to us, that's where he kind of made a cut, and kind of got to the next level. And that's why I think I get that credit where others don't, right. you know? So even though they did, you know, book people first or whatnot. Right. So then you started thinking about Evolve and just getting things rolling. Yeah, yeah, and that's when I knew what to do. You know, looking back, I probably should have started, um, my biggest regret in life, and I tell this to a lot of the guys now too, 
Um, I think in your 20s, you're, you're good. Like if you want to be a wrestler, here's my life advice. And I've been, I gave this to somebody who was recently let go from WWE too. If you're in your 20s, like you want to be a wrestler, you do everything that you can. Don't worry about making any money. You know, yeah. you, you go out, you work everywhere you can. You work out at the gym five days a week. You do whatever. <laughs> you, you do. I mean, but you, you dedicate yourself 100% to it, right? Mm -hmm. If you get to 30 and you're still kind of doing the indies and everyone's goal needs to be to go to WWE because you're not going to make money and you'll be able to sustain a living for a while, but you're going to end up being... It will dry out eventually. And you're going to end up being 40, 45, and, and life changes too, because like now I got a mortgage and a kid. Yeah. You know, so that's a lot different. The needs are way different. That's a, yeah. When I was started Ring of Honor, I had a one bedroom apartment for 400 bucks a month, right. you know? So, like, that was it. I paid, I would buy a used car every two years for two grand cash, which I'd save at that point. I'd know, you know, that was, I had no expenses. But you get older, you just start getting expenses. Yeah. You know, so your 20s, you dive in, you try travel everywhere, you know, you go overseas, you do whatever you can, you dedicate yourself 110%. When you get to 30, now it's time. I'm not saying you give up the dream, you keep doing the dream, but now, like I tell guys, you take Tuesday, Wednesday of every week and do nothing wrestling related and start doing something. Building now. life. Start, not even living life, but start- Building, start building, you know what I start mean? Start making contact, right. start finding another field. The mistake I made with Ring of Honor was I was 100%. So then, all right, I'm fired. It didn't work out because I always lived the life going, okay, I trusted Carrie in the rest of the office. And I was like, all right, we're going to grow this one day. And when it grows, I'm going to be here forever. And this is going to be it. And then when that didn't happen, and I got fired because it wasn't working. I mean, if Carrie was getting rich, I wouldn't have been fired. Right, right. You know, <laughs> he would have been like, all right, I'm getting rich. So, you know, so, so that, that's not a negative towards them. I, I took the fall because there wasn't money. There, you know, if mm -hmm. money was being made, I wouldn't have taken the fall. But, um, but anyway, so then you end up in a position where it's like, all right, I'm 30, what, how old was I? I'm 36, 37, I'm 37, and I've devoted the last seven years of my life, my, my whole 30s basically to this, and now I was so immersed in it that I had no other outside world so now I'm kind of screwed, mm -hmm. you know, now I got to start other promotions because I got, I don't know what else to do. And I'm, I'm in this like very narrow lifestyle, mm -hmm. you know? So now I tell guys, once you get in your thirties, it's time to start developing, take Tuesday, Wednesday or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, don't do any wrestling and start building other skills and other right. contacts so that it, when it does, I mean, you know, you're always one injury away too. True. If something like that happens, um, like, you know, I never dreamed, I thought, I never dreamed I'd end up getting fired and I'd keep going on. I thought Carrie would just shut it down and that would be that, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So if it's going to go on, the world keeps turning without you one way or the other. So if you, but when you end up and you're suddenly out of this thing, now you've kind of set a groundwork. Cause like I should have been making marketing contacts during mm -hmm. all those years. So when I was fired, I'd be like, okay, I can, I can see where I can go into there. marketing yeah, yeah, now, yeah. Or, or now I've built these relationships a little bit more and I've developed, you know what, I've, I've taken, I've taken Tuesday, Wednesday, and I've read a marketing book every, you know, and I've gotten, I read one marketing book a month or, you know, for, for the last few years. So yeah. now I have this knowledge. You have I an idea go, of where you can go. I can go right. into a job interview and be and like, if you hey, immerse yourself into one thing your whole life. Yeah. Especially when it's such a thing narrow thing. Out. Yeah. Right. But if you're in your 20s, I mean, I'm talking about this is what you do when you're no, 30 but that's and everything. Smart, yeah. you know, and I told this to a guy who was recently go from WWE, and I said, I go, listen, dude, I go, you need to spend, like, you're over 30 right now. They might call you back in a year. They always tell you they're going to call you back. Like, I've never had anyone get fired from there who's been like, okay, well, we're, you know, we're, you're, the door's shut. You're never coming back, you know, because mm. they don't want to tell you that anyways, because yeah, yeah. they don't want you to go start doing shit. Kill and, yourself. Yeah. Or they don't want you to start doing interviews and everything oh, and yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's so, so possible. Yeah, so, so Maybe they're not so worried about suicide. Yeah, but they'll, yeah, they're not worried about that. <laughs> so they'll tell you, uh, they'll tell you, um, you know, okay, well, we'll call, maybe they will call you back in a year, maybe they won't, but you need to start setting the groundwork so you don't find yourself being like I was, where you're like, holy shit, I'm 39 and I got an a infant now and I got a mortgage mm -hmm. and I got a wife. And like, this is all I know, you know? And that was like the mistake kind of I made in life was I put myself in that situation where I should have been taken. All right, you know what? Like every Sunday, I'm gonna read like 50 pages of something or I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn about networking for jobs or that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, you know? So that, that's my life advice right now from what I've learned. Cool. So. 
Uh, we try to keep these around two hours. We're already an hour and a half in, and I have a whole bunch of questions okay, the fans right. sent in. But I want to like just, I, you know, I don't want to just brush on fucking Evolve and Dragon Gate USA because that's what you're, you're doing now. But uh, like, um, I don't know. You've been doing it for what three years now? Two years? Two thousand two thousand nine. So we that's started, oh, yeah. it's way more. Yeah, it's five yeah. years at yeah, this yeah. point, man. Well, we're, time we're, flies. We're five years. But it doesn't seem that long because it's not like we're running a huge amount of shows. It's also, I think, uh, having kids just makes time. Yeah. like that's just a whole blurry period. Yeah, know? yeah, exactly. So, uh, out of all the shows you've done, anything sticks out to you? Like his favorite moments? Yeah, Saturday or Friday show we did. So yeah, this I love. I mean, it's still you still get that moment. It was it was awesome. Like you still talk about Ricochet winning. Yeah, that, Ricochet. Yeah. You still get that moment where it's like I heard it was great. It was awesome. And first of all, like my my legit favorite thing is seeing a guy like start out like at the bottom and like come up to the top. And like Ricochet is a dude when we booked him. Okay, I first saw him at Chikara. He was mm-hmm. one of the mass dudes. Yeah. And um and like the dude like he immediately blew me away because he did like the crazy. <laughs> Flippy, all yeah. this stuff, like nobody else. So I'm like, all right, this guy's awesome because he does the crazy flippy stuff. But he did nothing else. He had no charisma. Mm-hmm. He had nothing. <laughs> so like, like that was it. Like I, like I think his first match he did for us was like, I gave him like three or four minutes or something. It was just like, just do your flips. <laughs> and like since that time, he's just grown into like such an awesome all around performer. Yeah. And a lot of that is, I mean, one thing I am proud of with this whole Dragon Gate thing is that we have been able to get a lot of guys into Japan that haven't gotten mm-hmm. there. And I think Ricochet would have gone anyways because Shima loved him because he did the double moonsault. 2006, I was in Dragon Gate for two months. Yeah. Shima, every week. How is Ricochet? Yeah. I barely knew Ricochet at that point. He was just that small kid with the weird hair and the terrible gear. I was like, uh, Ricochet, okay, but green. Pac, Pac, very good, Pac. And he's like, Oh, Pac, very good. So I, I told Ricochet this. I kind of fucked him out of a job with Dragon Gate at first. Because <laughs> I was like, I, I didn't know him, but I knew Pac, and I loved Pac. And I'm like, if you think Ricochet's good, look at Pac. Yeah. So they brought Pac over. Okay. But about a year well, later... Ricochet wouldn't have been ready at that that's point a, anyways. It, I, see, I think yeah. that's too. Yeah, but I, I think true. about a year later, they were like, fuck it, we're bringing Ricochet yeah, in well, Because anyway. Shima loved the double moonsault. So, yeah, right. so I'm not saying we got Ricochet over there. No, no, but... Over there. But I, we still got... Like Nice had a tour, Gargano, yeah, yeah, no, and Chuck guys, Taylor, yeah. and Brody, and the, like we we're still able to get a lot of guys. So and I'm, you know, I'm proud of that. But Ricochet, like, dude, guys go to Dragon Gate and they get awesome. I mean, it happened back in ROH with Roddy and Jack Evans yeah. and Aries and everything. So Ricochet's had that awesome experience over there, and then he's just grown. So it's been amazing watching him grow that moment. And Gargano, I've just had so much fun working with Johnny Gargano. Like I've clicked with Gargano on yeah. like like few guys that I have, and the fact that we were able like a year. ago, Ago, over a year ago, we said, "Okay, you're gonna turn heel at WrestleMania weekend 2000, what, 2013, mm-hmm. right? And we're gonna have Ricochet lay the challenge to to a title match. And we're gonna, we knew right then, we we're like, we're gonna stretch this thing out to WrestleMania that ne- weekend next year. Like, we're gonna stretch this thing out for a year. And the fact that you get there a year later and you're, it happened, like." Because there's so many stuff that can happen. You of know, course. someone gets injured, someone yeah, gets yeah. signed. I'm thrilled when guys get signed. Mm-hmm. You know, but it's it's a it certainly game throws on. a wrench in your plans. Yeah, once but in a while. you know, but I, I am happy when they go. And um, and but you know, there's just or uh, something comes up or whatever. And then we were able to get there a year later, and with the build and everything, and then have that moment where then you say, okay, well we made it here a year later, but now we have the show and maybe the crowd, you know, they'll be dead for the main event and we'll get there and it'll be like, he'll get the pin and I'll be like, yay, and that'll yeah. be it. But then to have that moment where you're looking in the auditorium because I'm sitting, we were in a nice big auditorium and people kind of spread out if they weren't on the stage and we had people really far back and I'm sitting there in the dark and I'm watching the pinfall happens and I'm looking around and I see people in the back of the building jumping up and down and everything and you're like, all right, that's really cool, yeah. you know. It's even great timing too because uh, he's been racking up the, like titles left and right now that's that's so cool. i told him last year because last year he was like putting everybody over everywhere and he wasn't he doesn't care about putting people mm. over but he's like everyone's using me to come and put over the top guy and i go give him one more year yeah. and next year will be so it's great timing yeah. because like it makes your win seem even bigger because holy shit it's another one for him you know? yeah and now he's becoming and now when you have guys like generico leaving and everything you have those top spots on like yeah, the yeah. indies and now he's assuming yeah you need people to step up yeah yeah, yeah and he's growing into it so like even just having like that show on Friday. Last night show, I, uh, it didn't go as well as I wanted well, to. Well, I'll tell you, Friday night, the whole locker room, the whole Ring of Honor locker room was talking about <laughs> your show. Yeah. Because I saw a picture 
of Teddy Hart's cat in the top <laughs> turnbuckle and lost my mind. I showed everyone. I couldn't fucking believe it. He, the cat stays on the buckles as they, they run Yeah, the cat was stayed, uh, stayed on the buckle. Holy crap. It was weird though. When did you make the call to get Teddy on the shows? When the Dragon that Gate was like guys, when you found out the Dragon Gate guys yeah, couldn't come? Yeah, we were kind of just pulling things. Hey, yeah. dude, great move. Yeah. Holy <laughs> shit. That was awesome. Yeah, Sal pushed for it big yeah. time. So, uh, but yeah, it, it was it was interesting. <laughs> hey, it got people talk. At one point, the entire locker room of the other company was talking about your show. So that's what R. D. Evans said. It's like that's a real testament to game. I'm like, yeah, look, and that's true. Look at this cat. <laughs> So, all right, man, I feel bad that we spent not that much time on Dragon Gate USA and Evolve, yeah, but time. Yeah, I feel like we could have, I think we could easily do a part two you were worried about, but I think yeah. was, we got to get to the fan questions because I got so many of them. Okay. All right. I, I haven't read any of these in advance, by the way. I never do. So, uh, you know, some of them could be shitty. I don't know, but, uh, you know, let's see what happens here. All right. Greg would like to know, of all the talent you have worked with and booked from ECW, ROH, DG USA, and Evolve, who do you feel embodies your vision of what wrestling is or should be the most? That's a pretty deep wow, one. That's a pretty deep one. That is. That's you sent some good ones in, Greg. Yeah, I'm going to surprise some people with it. Let's do this. Loki. Yeah. Yeah, Loki. You color me shocked yeah. right Dude, now. Dude, I have the best conversation with Loki. Loki has so much to teach, and he gets it. His his thinking is maybe too old school. That might be where there's a little disconnect. But the dude, like, he gets it. I agree with you. Yeah. But I think the way he about it, he, he goes about things a lot of time is what makes like for me. I've met the dude, yeah. I have no problems with him personally, but I feel the way he applies his theory or his vision is just so weird that it well, makes me not interested in, the, you know what I mean? I, that's, that's where the disconnect is. But here's the whole thing is that you'll talk to Loki and he says a lot of things that I grew up learning uh -huh. from like Shane Douglas and Raven and Paul Heyman and it's stuff that now there's a disconnect between that generation and this generation. It's becoming completely lost on this generation. Uh -huh. And it's stuff about actually drawing money. You got promoters now and they're like, oh, we're, we, we're packed this place and they tweet a photo. And there's like 200 people in a small room and they're, mm. they're bragging about it. It's like, no, dude, that's not, the day you're bragging about three, 500 people, that shows you how crappy the business is now. Okay. That's nothing to brag about, you know? And it's because a lot of the guys now have not seen actual business done. I was there when ECW packed every single night, and even ROH, we had that run. Mm -hmm. And now this new generation, I don't think a lot of guys have seen that kind of business. And a lot of stuff Loki is preaching has been lost because we, there's been a gap now between veterans and veterans and this new generation. And it's just, it's, I think it overall is creating bad business. So if Loki can get his message across effectively, there's a lot to learn and there's not a lot of people that are teaching it. Right I've, I've said this before, I see his point on a lot of things. Yeah. I just feel like the way he goes about making his point, sometimes That's where the the, it's is. not the best way to reach out. Anyway. Yeah. Jeff Schwartz wants, has two questions. How much did you hate the, the ROH board back in the day? Did you hate it? I mean, I didn't hate it. Because if I hated it, we would have gotten rid of it, you know? But, um, I mean, I just... You know, it's annoying when you think you have a good show and people pick it, right. rip it pick apart. It apart. But what sure. but what I mean, but it's not annoying. I like, it's annoying. Where, where, where you get annoyed is you don't go, oh, they didn't like the show, man. Or like, oh, fuck this. It's you get annoyed because you're so dependent on that post-show buzz back then to sell the DVD, which is where you're going to make money and stay in business. So when you feel like you have a good show, and all of a sudden, like, it's, and I know when a show is good or not. I'll tell you when our show is not good. Mm -hmm. You can't, you don't fool yourself on that. Yeah. And, and, and it's just people nitpicking or missing stuff or whatever. And then you go, this is going to hurt our DVD sales. That's where you start kind of getting like yeah, yeah. That's annoyed with stuff. It's sure. not like a personal insult no, or anything like that. Mean. It's like you start getting worried that's going to affect your sure. business and your DVD that's sales. That's a pretty worry too. Yeah, which is your job. Right. It'd be well, like me going to somebody's job and going, uh, yeah. oh, you know, so and so. It's like sometimes I wish I could do that. Just go to know somebody's job and go write shit that they're customers or their superiors are going to read that's going to affect their income mm -hmm. and then go okay well tell me how you feel about it now yeah, that I'm affecting twice, your income. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Well that kind of answers the second one I think where he wants to know if you think message boards 
serve any purpose to wrestling in, in this day and age, but I guess... Well, I mean, now it's all Twitter. Right, that's... Right. I mean, it is a great tool, because if you do have something great and it spreads that buzz, then, you know, then it's good advertising. Yeah. It's just so negative, the tone of everything. A lot of it is, And yeah. people might be like, oh, they're bitching about it. But you read athletes, you read anybody in any form of entertainment, they bitch about Twitter and everything more than anybody yeah, at this yeah. point, you know? Bobby Gross, great name. Why is it that it takes more than a year for DVDs to be released of an event? And if you know of this problem, why have you done anything to fix it and get the shows out in a reasonable time frame? Okay, I mean, that's a fair question. I've, I've answered before. I'll do it real quick. Sure. It's basically, it's, it's me and Sal. It's a small operation. We don't have any, there's no TV company backing us right. or anything like that. And we made a decision um, to invest in our iPay-Per-View platform because we thought that's where the future is. We still believe in that. And it is obviously the future. Right. So we only have so many time and resources and you go, okay, we have to a lot of here or here. And we went iPay-Per-View and we were able, we broadcast six events on live eye pay-per-view with like just a couple of hiccups this weekend mm -hmm. all right that six events people could watch live as they happen and that's what people want now sure. so and we just uh, and we're doing an hd too we just did hd so we put our resources in that and unfortunately there's there if there's a tv company bagging us and and a bunch of editors and we'd have the dvds yeah. caught up but we're, we're we just we just released something like five or six DVDs, and we have another three on the way. Okay. So they're coming out quicker, okay. so we're making progress. James Borbath, <laughs> sorry, uh, he has one question for you. Says, uh, since uh, a lot of the top guys in WWE now are people that ROH produced from back in your day with them, do you feel any sense of satisfaction from that? I mean, I'm happy for them personally. Yeah. You know, uh, people go, are you proud of them? I go, why am I proud of them? I'm not doing any of the work, you know, but what? like, I mean, I'm proud of the guys. I haven't done anything, you know, it's, to it's, help them. I'm, I'm so proud. I'm super happy. I'm, I'm happy for them. I'm happy to see them get what they deserve. Anybody that I had a long run with is a quality person because mm -hmm. I don't deal with people who aren't quality people. Yeah. And that means that they deserve what they got. And I would like... You know, I, I like when Brian did that huge thing with the Wyatts and the cage, and he turned and the place is going nuts like yeah. that. I get a little teary eyed. No, you me know? too. It me was, too. It was, it was emotional. Last year, thing. Uh, Toronto, Edge opened the show, like Edge with Brian, yeah. the, the promo, and Triple H came out to interrupt them. But when it started, you know, it's easy to go, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. It's fun, and it's cool to see the whole crowd going. But in Toronto, when Edge was doing, the, like, before they started the interview, people were chanting Daniel Bryan, the whole arena. Yeah. Not yes, Daniel. That got me because that was yeah. Yes is a catchphrase. It's like people chanting ROH or EC Dub. It's not the same. They were chanting for him. Yeah, that really and got you, me. And you know what he went through. I mean, yes, I, yes. I was there when when he almost quit numerous times, mm -hmm. or or and when he you know I seen how he traveled. I seen how he lived. And when he fought through that shoulder and he still worked for us and as a champion with that shoulder and he'd come back to the locker room, I'd sit there with him and he'd be in so much pain, there's nothing you can do and all that and now you're seeing it pay off and and it's it's just super cool. That's yeah. why I bought my ticket to Mania. I, I'm, I'm, I bought it and it, it was expensive and I'm going by myself because literally I, I have to see Brian live that's tonight. What I, like, that's why I have to go because of that. Yeah, Everything. I swore I that I, I would I've never gone to Maine or had a desire to and I'm I'm concerned. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm going I mean seeing seventy thousand people react. I mean uh, hopefully Triple H doesn't win and that's it. Then we'll be sitting there going <laughs> <laughs> I just wasted my whole fun my all night. You I know? <laughs> but um but uh Holy but shit. I'm like that 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 that's the one thing that would get me to go. I feel just, like yeah, it's no, like no. me and Brian have lost touch. We don't talk Ever, you know, like we've texted maybe once or twice in the last three years. I've seen him and, you know, we always, we were never close friends, but we were always on good terms. But I've shared moments with this guy just like you had yeah. and you guys were probably like really close at one point. I feel like I have to go because of, hey, he put me over in a ring once. Yeah. He put me over. You know what I mean? And I feel like that was. Well, he's like one of us. It's like Goodfellas when they're making Joe Pesci. Right. Except hopefully yeah. he doesn't get shot in the head. <laughs> but like, it was like, you know, he's, he's. He came from where we came from, yeah. and, and we've seen the work that he put in to get there, you know. So, right. and I'm super happy, you know, like Brody Lee. I know what he went through yeah. to get there, and and Moxley, yeah. and you know, Tyler. and and it's I, I want to see, you know, like it breaks my heart when I see a guy like Jimmy Jacobs. Like I want to see him make that mm -hmm. kind of money, 
deserves it, you know? And, like, I want to see... That's just one name, sure. you know, because we talked about them earlier. Yeah. But, you know, and the Briscoes, I know what they've done. You know, I want to see everybody make that money. I don't want to see them ending up, you know, 41 with a mortgage and a kid and sure. struggling to make it, right. you know? So. Matt Cruz wants to know if WWE has ever approached you for a writing job. Nah. No? No. If they would, would you do no. it? No. No? No. I could have gotten a job. I'm sure Heyman could get me in yeah. if I really wanted to go uh, throughout the course of time. But he's always uh, greatly dissuaded it. Mm -hmm. All those people who come from the WWE office, they just seem like damaged by the yeah. time they leave. Mm -hmm. You know? And you're not... I think you're that's not true of most jobs, though. Yeah. You know? Like, when you're somewhere long enough, yeah. there'll be things you'll take away from it that aren't, you know? Yeah. Um, Daniel Brewer... Wants to know, in your opinion, what's the most underrated show that you've ever been a part of? He says that he was at the DG USA show in North Carolina and was completely blown that, away. That, the Open the Southern Gate, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah, okay. that show just came out of nowhere. That was that was just like a, a really awesome show. I just love it when you have these shows that you don't have like high mm -hmm. expectations for and they just totally click. The Evolve shows we had in Florida earlier this year, that's another example. All three of them, especially the first night in uh, Ybor City, mm -hmm. like we did, we had like five matches and they were all just like awesome. It was just it was super cool. Okay. Dalton Bailey uh, wants to know who are some of the guys on the indies that are not in DG USA that are on your radar? I mean, there's lots of guys I never like to tip my hand too yeah. much, you know, <laughs> so, especially I name Sorry, name, Dalton. Name. Yeah, the, like, this comes out whenever it does, and it's like, the dude's sitting there, and like, it still has a call. Yeah. <laughs> it's been two years. <laughs> well, Timothy Terse, or Terese, has the exact same question. Sorry, bud. It's not happening. Uh, Pete Whalen wants to know, of, if any uh, WWE or TNA star was released today, who would you want it to be, and why? You know, you'd want them, I assume, so you could use them on a show, but who would it be? Uh, I'm trying to think of someone who's an asshole that I just want to see. Oh, I the see. Homeless. Uh, El Generico or Sami Zayn. Uh, I, I take that, what? dude. That's two different people. El Generico's not there. Um, all right, he's got some more questions here. What was it like working with Jim Cornette? Some people hate him. He took the time to write Kevin Included, which is incorrect. I don't hate Jim. I need to say that. Uh, not as you know, we're not uh, we're not friends or anything, but I don't hate him. I loved working uh, with Cornette. Yeah, 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 I did. He was great to work with. Okay, um, I think he has a, a ton to offer. I agree. Yeah, and and like I said, there's that disconnect between like the old school and exactly. the new school now, and I think that there's a lot. Him and Loki would really hit it off. Probably. They, and they would, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Like I I think he has a ton to offer. Uh, he's a genius. And I love it. He was great to work with. Yeah. He never imposed himself on you. Hey, I had like, some great moments with him. Yeah. Like, in the ring, promos with him were awesome. Yeah. I loved it. Like, it was a legitimate thrill. I legitimately don't have one negative thing to say about working with Jim Cornette. All right. uh, he also wants to know, when will the first Evolve show be back up for sale on the website? Probably by the time this comes out. All right. Look at that. <laughs> uh, maybe you'll be watching look, it. Look, right at, look for it at highspots.com. All right. What are your honest feelings about Davey Richards? Oh, boy. Come on, Pete. Well, we made up recently. Yeah? yeah. Okay, good. Uh, Davey, you know... It was a little shaky for a while there. It was right? shaky for a while, but we made up, so, you know, it's what. But I think that's right? how Davey lives. That's just the way it is. You know what? Me and Davey were shaky I'll, for a I'll while. I'll tell the story. Yeah, when sure. Davey, when he was, you know, leaving Ring of Honor and he was looking at TNA or WWE, he emailed me. And he goes, yeah, I just want to apologize for how everything went. And I was a dick. I met him back, and I go, you know, that's great, those are words, but, like, you cost me money, and what are you going to do to, like, make this up? Like, these are all just words, and there's a lot of words that come out of your mouth. And I agree, and, and I think I've told Davey that, too. Yeah, and I go, he so, talks too much. Yeah, so I go, so now you're giving me more words that you're sorry. So I go, what are you going to do, like, to, to make this good? And he goes, I'll come work a show for you. And he did. He came work the show yeah. for us, and then it's like I got, like you got to give the guy credit there. He, he made he, he he made everything up right there. All right, Tom Blackett sends me questions on a regular basis for these. How would you explain the difference between Evolve and Dragon Gate USA? Because in the line outside of your shows once, an old man told me that Dragon Gate's the one with the Asians. Would you agree <laughs> with that, or was he a bit racist? Well, he said Asians. Not, I drive me crazy when people say Orientals, because Orientals is a rug. It's not I a once, people. I remember uh, I did a promo uh, after uh, we wrestled Dragon Gate guys, and you were filming it, and I said, man, uh, those Japs are so fast. And you're like, are you crazy? 
<laughs> we can't say that, but why not? Yeah, I mean, there was more of a divide before, but now it's pretty much a DGUSA sometimes has a Japanese. So, right. Yeah. So what's the difference between Evolve and DGUSA in your opinion, though? It's all pretty much it's the same thing at this point, right? Same, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, does the, he... He usually I mean, he sends me questions for every show, and he asks the wrestlers would they wrestle New Jack? Everybody, but he wants to know if you would like if you would hire New Jack. Actually, this is funny because uh, a year ago or so, uh, there were serious talks of bringing New Jack in as yeah. a manager. Really? Okay? Because here's my thing, right? If you're the best in the world at doing one thing, or among the best in the world at doing one thing, I'm interested in booking you. Sure. I don't care if it's a drop kick, okay, uh, or whatever. And New Jack is still a hell of a promo. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, I, mean, I, don't know. I still I think, think, in my opinion, he's still all the promo. So there was talks that, but it just didn't happen. Okay. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Case Low, that's his name, wants to know what gets you more angry? When that you have high pay per view problems or when the fin- the Phillies blow a big game? <laughs> the high pay per view problems. Yeah. <laughs> it could I've given up on the Phillies. I've given up on the Phillies. Right. Yeah. All right. Last one Dale Hicks. He has two questions, he says. The first, he sat in the front row at the ECW when Shane Douglas threw the NWA title down. I watched it back and thought for sure it was him. Oh, did you sit in the front row? Were you in the front row no. for that? No. Okay. No. Do you want to hear a story about that night? Sure. That? Yeah. It's actually Heyman. That's when I first started really talking to him and everything. And he called me up the night before the show. He goes, how do you think the tournament's going to play out? So I was like, uh, I think this dude's going to win. This dude's going to win. And he goes, you just got 100% right. And I was like, this is the first time I ever heard it. I just can't believe you just told me all the results. Right. Right. But then the big swerve was throwing the belt down. He didn't tell yeah. me that part. But you got all like, <laughs> yeah. the actual match results. But it was the fact he was kind of setting me up there because right. all the match results are extremely predictable. Mind. But that's a booking lesson I right see. there. You made all that extremely predictable. So that the end and is okay. kind of mind-blowing. It's a contrast there. The second question is, what is your favorite Paul Heyman story? I guess that's it. That's yeah. He wins on, goes on and on. But what's your favorite Paul Heyman story? Uh, I don't know. I've told a bunch of them. I'm much. bad at telling stories. Yeah, on it's all good. Like that. They just kind of come off. Fair enough. I've told I've told a few Heyman stories in here. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Baseball cap. Well, that was it for now, and uh, that's it. We're done. So, is there anything you want to plug before we call it a call uh, it a day? Yeah, sure. WWNLive.com for all your eye pay per view needs. Shine. Literally all of them. Yeah. Seriously. Shine, DGUSA, Evolve. Uh, How involved are you in Shine? That's the not one at all. No, you're not no. at all. Yeah, but I it's just, just it's just, carried on your. Yeah, own. I just promote it sometimes. Okay. Yeah, online. Um, are that's you still all are you still doing stuff with FIP? Like I know nah, they still run, but you're not. Either. Okay, yeah, I'm not doing anything okay. either. Um, see, my life, like when you knew me in ROH, my entire life was wrestling. Sure. And now wrestling's like a part of my life. Right. You know, like, it's a lot uh, healthier, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. I saw I saw Cheerleader Melissa for the first time in like four years or something okay. last night, and she was like, "You look so much healthier than right. like the last time I saw you." So, um, but anyways, DGUSA.tv is our website, and DGUSA.tv. And I want to thank High Spots. You guys are awesome, and uh, you do a lot of great things for the indies. And I, I hope everyone realizes that. So, thank you very much for having me. I Thanks, tell man. everyone all the time. Thanks, man. I really enjoyed I it. it. I'm glad man. you came too. on. I am too. Thanks right. for having me. Hey, we'll get a part two in one day. I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.